Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, January 7th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, the editor of Current Affairs Magazine, author of Why You Should Be a Socialist, Nathan J. Robinson will join us. Also on the program today, the U.S. military sends a letter declaring we are pulling out of Iraq and says that was a mistake. Sorry. Psych. Pentagon rejects uh, Donald Trump's threat to target Iranian cultural sites. So we've got that going for us. United States bars uh, the Iranian foreign minister from entering this country to speak with the U.N. And John Bolton now claims he'll answer a Senate subpoena to testify as Murkowski and Collins fold to Mitch McConnell on witnesses. Meanwhile, the 2020 race, Sanders and Warren set to unleash on Biden and U.S. to start collecting DNA at the border. Back to that Democratic debate. It looks now to be five people. Klobuchar, Buttigieg, Biden, Sanders, and Warren. I love the Klobuchar dead enders so much. There you go. Well, who knows? Who knows? She's, she's still in it. And lastly, up to a billion animals have died in Australian wildfires as they continue to rage. All this and more on today's program. Uh, welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, the stuff that's happening in uh, in Australia is just um, it, it's it's a nightmare. Um, we got a call the other day from someone in Melbourne who uh, told us that um, they have uh, ash in uh, Melbourne, you know, which is I think uh, hundreds of miles away from uh, the nearest fires. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been fo- following various threads on Twitter, reading about just what, what, a, what a hellscape it is. It's a real, um, it's just, it's a horror. And, I mean, not to mention, the temperatures are just incredibly uh, and seemingly unbearably high across the country. So this is, and, and you know, the, the thing that's very, I think, hard to... Um, really digest is that there's no it it doesn't go it doesn't get better from here this is not there may there may there may be a uh a a respite from this in like in australia in in the specific places right there may be some downtime from raging fires uh in, in in california let's say but it doesn't get better in an, in an extended and ongoing basis anywhere. Uh, it's only going to get worse. And so, um, yeah, you well, know. we do have the technology to make sure that it doesn't get too much worse, but the primary obstacles are political. Yeah, of course. So get, get to work, everyone. Political. Yeah, of course. I mean, it is, uh, so much of it is about sort of will and competitions of will. Uh, so, 
uh yeah I, I don't know there's and and you know i did also get an email and uh it's 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 a bit long to 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 discuss but um the of course you know sort of the the, the brunt of this as in as it will be at least you know in any in any situation particularly with like any type of natural disaster but also i think probably man made um that indigenous people um and people without uh, wealth are are the ones who are going to pay the biggest price um at least initially and geographically distributed i mean you know it's it's uh, the amazon is literally genocidal towards indigenous people but just even um i was watching an interview with the prime minister of uh saint kitts and nevis and he's just like yeah like we we have to develop these climate strategies for our island with pretty limited resources and net admissions of basically nothing right um i mean and you know this is the there it's always the canary in the coal mine is basically that explains just about every dynamic and every danger that um that we have and the canary in this instance is just um those people who are uh, most vulnerable because they either lack uh, resources specifically or they lack um, they lack sort of financial resources or material resources or political resources. I mean that is that's basically the way that um, uh, almost every dynamic can be explained. I mean even the story of uh, the US to start collecting DNA at the border. It's a pilot program, folks. It's a pilot program. And it's just a, it's a pilot program. It, just, it sounds so much more fun when it's a pilot program, doesn't it? We're trying yeah. out some new stuff. See if it's going to work. We U.S. government. This, uh, zany character. Exactly. White guy. Well, it's not quite that type of pilot. But uh, the U.S. government on Monday has launched a pilot program to collect DNA from people in immigration custody and submit it to the FBI. It's plans to expand it nationwide. People as young as 14 will be subject to DNA collection. And the information will go into a massive criminal database run by the FBI where it would be held indefinitely. In other words, forever. A memo outlining the program published Monday in the Department of Homeland Security said U.S. citizens and permanent residents holding a green card who are detained could be subject to DNA testing, as well as asylum seekers and people entering the country without authorization. And now I've got news for you, folks. Like every other national security, like every other uh, policing it starts with the most vulnerable, those people who have the least political power or material power, sometimes both, or one or the other. And they it's a pilot. They're testing it out. They're getting the bugs out of it. And then it'll just come to all of us. First, it'll be just the first. It'll be just American citizens who uh, enter into the criminal justice system. And then it'll be people who just get pulled over for traffic violations. And then it's like, if you want to take a flight, uh, got to give us some of your DNA. That way we can get you through quicker. And then it's just, uh, it, it'll replace easy passes. And so if you want to, you want to pay for a toll as you're coming across the bridge and then boom, boom, boom. And then, and then, and then we all have, now I look, I can't tell you what's going to be wrong or problematic with, uh, this massive database of uh, DNA. I don't know that the government, frankly, has the resources to um, make it as problematic as, say, like uh, when people break into it <laughs> uh, will, or when at one point somebody says, we've got all this DNA, we should sell it to um, to uh, pharmaceutical companies via some type of... Um, NIH grant or something. I mean, that's ultimately that'll be what the problem is. Uh, but this is the way, you know, this is the way we roll in this country. Um, let's get back to the uh, matter at hand, which is the Trump administration's uh, seemingly desire 
either to get into a war with Iran or make it feel like we're going to get into a war with Iran or just shake stuff up. You know, one of the things that um, I don't know if there is a Republican foreign policy establishment anymore, frankly, that is not consistent with a neocon one. The, the Republican... The Republican foreign policy, I guess, um, the, 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 the Republican foreign policy, d doctrinally speaking, seems to me to have been the Obama administration with perhaps um, a, a slight derivation here or there. You know, sort of like a uh, realism, but still uh, fairly merit uh, militaristic and... Uh, we're just going to focus more on special ops and uh, keep those low level, um, you know, realpolitik, everything else more or less the same. The Republican foreign policy primary doctrine seems to be neoconservat uh, neoconservatism. And because even Donald Trump, who was supposedly breaking that mold, right? Uh, cannot staff anybody but these neoconservatives in his administration. There just doesn't seem to be any other Republican foreign policy apparatus. And so what we're seeing now could be a, basically, I think, a twofer. I think Donald Trump, you know, this is Paul Wolfowitz sitting down and saying this is the one thing that we could agree upon was weapons of mass destruction, even though there wasn't any. We just we all needed a, a something that we could sign on to that wouldn't interfere with our particular agendas. And I think that's what we're probably witnessing now, which is Donald Trump is like, so this will help me with my uh, campaign, A, B, and so I will get that hotel in Riyadh or um, in... He said that if I kill him, they will get Ivanka a duty-free shop at the Kuala Lumpur I mean, airport. There's, I think the answer speaks for itself. I, I mean, there, God, that's I don't, not even funny. I don't know what the specific get was, but the idea that there wasn't one of those gets is uh, is is would be. There's never been a branded partnership with Ralph Lauren perfumes before. Exactly. I mean, there's something, and then the 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 other element of it is. That clearly guys like Pompeo and uh, Milley and Pence and whatever other names, you know, um, uh, Raytheon, uh, Raytheon, Secretary Raytheon, um, and what other other names that we don't know who make up the sort of like, uh, you know, the lieutenant level foreign policy advisors to those, you know, the undersecretaries, basically, of those people, they all probably uh, subscribe to this idea that anything we can do to destabilize that region, even if it's unpredictable, is good. Like, I, you know, uh, Dick Cheney, I don't think, has had a single day in his life since shock and awe where he thought Iraq didn't work out well. I don't think he's had a single day where he didn't think, you know, I think it mission did accomplished. It did. Exactly. They, they, there was contracts awarded. The regimes were destabilized. They don't care about the proliferation. Yeah, they don't care about anything else. And I think like the destabilization, it, it goes like this, folks. Like if if you are you perceive yourself as in terms of the United States to be a a uh, hundred foot a uh, hundred story tower in a city of other buildings, none of which get past 60 stories. Or maybe there's one or two other buildings that are 100-story towers. If there's some type of event that knocks out 50 stories from everybody, guess what? There's only you and one or two others standing. Everybody else gets, gets his, his in rubble. And if you're, if you're in the penthouse, you're still in the penthouse. Of that 50 story building. Well, it's 100. Now it's 50. But guess what? There's not, there's really nothing else. Everything else is still 50 stories behind you, below you, at least. And so I think that's the theory. That's the only way 
to make any type of rational sense of this, that it's not that they don't have a strategy. It's that their strategy, their goals are just escaping most rational people. Yeah, it's good for business. It, we got those. The, our arms uh, it's good. stocks are soaring right now. It's good for business. It's good for domination. It doesn't matter if it costs us uh, X, Y, or Z because it's costing them more. And that's the, that's the theory. And it distracts the working class of both countries from protesting for their rights and divides people against one another. I, I, it's possible. Uh, it's possible. I don't, I mean, I've I think that. I've seen it happen. Well, I think that happens. Uh, but I don't know if that's necessarily like. It's not conscious always, but it does function that way. Yes, I have no doubt. I mean, certainly it's undercut the reformers in Iran. Of uh, I don't, I just want to say, I mean, it's under, I think here there's actually less juice for it. I think the public is relatively war wary in the United States, according to polls. But in Iran, like, I mean, look, I mean, how we responded to September 11th is obscene and has wrecked the world. But the, you know, I, I don't reject all of the basic impulse of people being angry about that event. There's total validity in that. And so I don't even know. I mean, if you talk to people who are quote unquote reformers in Iran, I don't know. I mean, they would actually say, no, we're just, we're not undermined. We're unified. Like yeah. this is totally unacceptable. Well, and we're synchronized feeling. in our foreign policy view right now. I mean, that's the total message. And, you know, the broader them being they've been undermined since the day Trump got in office and well, started killing the Iran deal. I mean, right. that was what totally right, right. Because the Supreme Leader said he specifically said under Obama, he said, I endorse these negotiations, but I will never trust the United States. So you right. have my permission to pursue it, but it's not going to end well. Right. That's it. Right. Well, they're probably feeling a lot of the same feelings that Americans felt on September 11th and you you know how much that changed our culture here so I don't know why it would be any different over there yeah right um here is um Kellyanne Conway being asked a question in fact a series of questions now these are dogged questions about Donald Trump's tweet let's put the tweet up first uh the tweet was Donald Trump uh, in the the wake of the assassination of Soleimani. Uh, and he's saying, Iran is take, talking very boldly about targeting certain U.S. assets as a revenge for our ridding the world of their terrorist leader who had just killed an American and badly wounded many others, not to mention all the people he killed over his lifetime, including recently hundreds of Iranian protesters. He was already attacking our embassy and preparing for additional hits in other locations. I mean, it's been quite clear that that was not the case. Uh, Iran has been nothing but uh, problems for many years. Let this serve as a warning. If Iran strikes any Americans or American assets. Now, this was, of course, in response to uh, both uh, the Hezbollah leader and the Iranian Supreme Leader saying, hey, reminder, we're not attacking American citizens. No way. No one should do that. When we chant death to America, we're talking about Trump, Bolton and Pompeo. And so Trump is a little bit nervous about his own stuff here. So he goes on to say, uh, let this serve as a warning that if Iran strikes any Americans or American assets, we have targeted 52 Iranian sites and parens representing the 52 American hostages taken by Iran many years ago, which is insane. Some at very high level and important to Iran and the Iranian culture and those targets and Iran itself will be hit very fast and very hard. The U.S. wants no more threats. OK, so be clear here. We have targeted 52 Iranian sites. And they will be hit very hard. So here is a question, multiple questions being doggedly asked of uh, Kellyanne Conway by a woman named Shabon Kennedy. Now, you know these are going to be dogged questions, or I should say she's from the BBC, um, or Ch excuse me, Channel 4. You know uh, this is a uh, member of the foreign press because they're willing to burn their access to the White House by asking a relevant question and being dogged about it, as opposed to, like, 
um, either one that's going to get me on the anchor desk or uh, one that will uh, get me further access so I can do my book later and uh, make some cash. Kellyanne, how do you square the fact, though, that the President and Secretary of State do seem to be saying two different things around They're not. cultural? They do seem to be. The President seems to say we are targeting cultural sites, which would be illegal. He didn't say he's targeting well, cultural sites. He, he, did he not say that? He said that he he's, was openly asking the question, why in the world they're allowed to maim people, put, put off roadside bombs, kill our people, torture our people. I thought he said he was targeting 52 sites, some of which were cultural sites within Iran, which would be he illegal. He said that they identified 52 sites. But so they, can you Are say, you speaking about hypotheticals or, or, or I got to deal in reality today? Well, I'm asking you, is he speaking about, is he speaking you, about hypotheticals are, you, or is he actually targeting those sites? You're engaging in hypotheticals? No, she's is asking he, about something the President of the United yeah, States said he, on the record. Is he Kelly speaking out. about hypotheticals or are you actually targeting sites which would be illegal, which is exactly he's identified what sites. Secretary of State Pompeo has said? Well, He's identified, I mean, everybody can identify cultural sites, but when you say we've targeted them, that means that you've targeted them. Like, I don't even know what, I, like, I don't even know what the, in other words. He's targeted them the, for identification. The only other, there is no other word that more explains the idea of targeting than the word target. Like, to make a target. And, um, you know, remember, Donald Trump has already used Twitter, particularly in the past couple of days. It's like sort of the, the official way that he's going to notify Congress under the War Powers Act. So uh, well, I think we can take these fairly seriously. Now, he could be lying, but if he's lying, they should say that. The Pentagon, meanwhile, felt obligated to uh, announce that it <laughs> we will not be targeting uh, Iranian cultural sites, but this is, um, you know, the, it's, it's all mission accomplished for them. And, and really, I think the big test will be at least in the context of domestic politics, um, how it impacts, uh, the impeachment hearings we will see over the past, uh, the next couple of days. Um, there's all sorts of weird dynamics with that. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later, but I, I'll just say, I'll, I'll wrap it. Uh, I'll say it quickly with this. Um, Mitch McConnell seems to have been able to discipline his caucus, or I should say at the very least, the idea that there's a March deadline for primaries uh, against people like uh, Susan Collins at all, um, and that has yet to pass, and that has disciplined the caucus in terms of calling for witnesses. The danger that Mitch McConnell has is that Nancy Pelosi will not feel pressure or will get pressure to withhold articles of impeachment as more stuff comes out. I saw a tweet from Lev Parnas's lawyer the other day, yesterday, tweeting out to Kevin McCarthy, time for witnesses, Kevin. And there's a picture of Lev with his arm around Kevin McCarthy. Now this is, this is after, like, I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea what's going on, but it's nuts. It's really nuts. We're living in a very, very effed up time, folks. That encouragement. Yep. <laughs> Hypernormalization. Hey, um, folks, this program today is sponsored by Grove.co, the Grove Collaborative. Healthy, plant based, non toxic cleaning products. They work, folks. And the good ones are actually far more enjoyable to use. In fact, in, uh, in, in, in my neighborhood, like here and in my home, uh, they are exclusively the ones I use now. Partially because I have kids, partially because I'm a little sensitive. A little bit. <laughs> oh, no. So, but where do you start? Who do you trust? That's where Glove Collaborative comes in. Glove Collaborative is the online marketplace that delivers all natural home, beauty, and personal care products directly to you. You don't have to go out and figure out which is the best brands or what is good. That's what the Glove Collaborative is all about. It takes the guesswork out of going green because every Grove.co, it's Grove.co product is guaranteed to be good for you, your family, your home, the planet. For me, uh, those seventh generation, no smell, no dye, no scent, 
hand soaps are key. We got about uh, like a half a dozen of those sitting under the sink now, one on top of the sink there, one on top of the bathroom. And uh, the other thing that got that the, the Glove uh, the, the Grove Collaborative got me into was they have and I probably should have looked up the name of it, but it's 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 a Grove, I think, branded uh, product where they it's a concentrate. And I got yeah, a I'm glass bottle. This. I got a glass spray bottle that has actually like a silicone rubber around it. And I fill up my own cleaning uh, fluid. So I don't have all the crappy bottles. I'm not doing all, you know, it's not that, it's not a huge deal, but it's less uh, garbage I'm putting out there. But the stuff is safe. I've got it in the bottle. And it's, it, it smell is, it does have a smell, but it's not, uh, it's not one that bothers me. And uh, it's incredibly effective. Can't beat that seven generation, though. That's for me. That's the big one. But now you can join over a half a million families who trust Grove Collaborative to make their homes happier and healthier. Plus, shipping is fast and free on your first order. For a limited time, when listeners go to grove.co slash majority, listen carefully, it's .co slash majority, you will get free five-piece cleaning set from Mrs. Myers and Grove. That's a $30 value. Go to grove.co slash majority to get this exclu exclusive cleaning offer. Grove.co slash majority. Check it out. All right, quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to the editor of Current Affairs, Nathan J. Robinson, on his argument as to why you should be a socialist. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. Pleasure to welcome back to the program the editor of Current Affairs, a uh, periodical you should all be subscribing to, uh, and the author of Why You Should Be a Socialist, Nathan J. Robinson. Uh, welcome to the program, Nathan. Oh, it's so nice to be back with you, Sam. Uh, so, all right, Nathan, I, I, I enjoyed this. I think that this is, you know... I, uh, just broadly speaking, you know, we get calls from people who are like, what book should we read if I, if I want to become, you know, uh, mm. a, 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 a socialist or a, a, a democratic socialist or a social Democrat or, yeah. uh, something to that effect. And, um, I feel like this is a great sort of gateway book for people and not only yeah. Do I think that? I don't think it's just why you should be a socialist, but it's sort of like how, uh, like a pra like, mm. a, like almost like yeah. a practical guide, half of it is. But let's just start with this. And I know you don't get too caught up on, uh, on what a socialist is, um, but let's, but, but with that said, just give us a vague notion, if you will, yeah. or at least a, sure. a, a decent one. And, and, and contrast and compare for me uh, social democrat versus do uh, democratic socialist. Sure. Yeah. Well, just the thing you said, I mean, I get those all the time, people saying, what what should I read? How do I find out, uh, you know, what these things are? And this is sort of my come join the left book. So even if we don't get, uh, you know, bogged down in the terminological disputes, for pe you know, broad left, and this is also sort of my, this is what the left is, this is what we believe, this is what we're fighting for thing. Um but so, yeah, um, you know, immediately people get to, OK, well, wait, all right. So what is very precisely what is socialism? And of course, it's frustrating. That's a difficult question because socialists have spent the entire history of the socialist movement arguing over what socialism is, with some socialists pointing at each other and saying, you're a social democrat, you're not a real socialist. Um, and so, I mean, I, I start with um, you know, socialists sort of start with Eugene Debs 
and they start with a few kind of principles. The thing that he said about while there's a lower class, I am in it. While there's a soul in prison, I am not free. So there's this very strong animating ethic of solidarity. Uh, this, this, you know, workers of the world unite. This looking at the kind of uh, the, the proletarian class of the world and really disliking the existence of a class hierarchy, the existence of a small number of people who own stuff and a much larger number of people who sort of do the labor and don't reap so many of the rewards. Um, now, the, the term social democracy is a little frustrating because a lot of socialists have called themselves social democrats. The German Social Democratic Party uh, it was a socialist party. Currently, the prime minister of Finland is both a member of the Social Democratic Party, which is a member of the Socialist International. So these distinctions aren't always clear. And I think like Bernie Sanders, for example, is both a social democrat and a democratic socialist. But the way that I would define, like, if you're a socialist, the core if you're a socialist, is socialists are kind of utopians. They're kind of real radicals who look, you know, many years into the future and who sort of dream of, like, what would happen if we fulfilled all of our core principles, if we had a world in which people uh, were treated fairly and had what they needed and... You know, and so that's kind of where we start is with this very, very radical vision for a different world. And I think I think it's true that if you just find people find if you find people who just call themselves social democrats, they don't quite have that same anime sense of like we have a very powerful vision of what well, you know, socialists are always saying a better world is possible. Right. And they and they do. They think about like what would it mean if you didn't have a division between the owners and the workers. What would it mean if you had a world without borders? What would it mean if you had a world without war? And and that's kind of what you'll find in a lot of socialists that characterizes the tendency. Um, and Nathan, you know, uh, we're, you're breaking up a little bit. Can, can we just call you back on your phone? We're gonna sure. We'll, we'll do that. We're gonna take a quick okay. break, folks, and people uh, just bear with us. All right, appreciate it. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, all right. So, uh, Nathan, so with that said, um, you know, with the specifics out of the way and it's, you know, it's funny uh, because <laughs> I sometimes take phone calls from libertarians. And the, the, the first thing that happens I is it, 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 it takes like <laughs> about 15, 20 minutes before, you know, after they're done um, slagging every other libertarian who's ever called this program or been interviewed on this program or any other libertarian I've talked to and told me why. Their libertarianism is not libertarianism, uh, and there then they have a very specific libertarianism that they espouse yeah. uh, that involves like yeah. three or four different adjectives. Um, and so I appreciate the idea that um, the socialism can be sort of a broad term, or at least you perceive it that way. Um, yeah. And um, and and I think that's one of the things I liked about your um, uh, your book is that it's sort of got a, a, a wide mouth funnel uh, on some level and trying to bring a lot of people in. Yeah. Um, let, let, yeah. Let's talk about this notion, though, of of utopianism. Um, and because that is one of the things that I think as I have talked to people over the years is that um, and partly because I'm not quite a boomer, but uh, I know that it makes yeah. people feel comfortable to think that I am. But it, I think there is a sort of like I have been trained to have a lack of imagination. And uh, one yeah. of the things that you really promote is is to have more of one in terms of like what we would want. You're right. Yeah, I think it's so important, actually. I mean, the word utopianism is considered you know, dismissed as just idle dreaming. But I think a lot of social progress comes because there are some people who are able to imagine things being very, very different, right? Imagining the end of slavery requires seeing far beyond what's in front of your eyes and really envisioning what a different way of arranging human social relations would be like. And I mean, some people have pointed out that like, if you, if you existed in a world before the public library, the public library would sound as crazy 
as some of the schemes that socialists are putting forward today, right? You know, we just want a place we can get free books. You don't have to pay. They just hand them to you. You get to say, right? I mean, you know, free college uh, sounds pretty similar today. And people are saying, well, how, how on earth would you pay for that, right? How, right. Could it give free, free access to all, all books to everyone, right? But the socialists are the ones who have said, well, let's think about what do we really want out of life? What would a good world look like? They, the, the, the globe is kind of, the, you know, in, its, in the form that we've been given is kind of a Garden of Eden. It is a place with, as George Orwell said, enough provision. It's a raft sailing through space with provisions enough for everyone. So what would our ideal world look that like? And that causes socialists to say, well, you know, war shouldn't be taken for granted. It should be considered a problem that we have to eliminate. Borders, militarized borders are, are kind of the same way. And can we imagine a world without these things? And that's, what, and that's why you see in every generation, the people who are labeled the socialists, are the ones dragging things in the right direction historically, right? So it's Bernie Sanders and AOC who are the only ones pushing a, an adequate climate plan or the only ones saying, let's rethink the whole healthcare system from the bottom up. And I think that's always really helpful. The socialists were once the only ones saying, let's have an eight-hour day and a 40-hour week and a weekend. And then those things became normal because people were able to dream of things that other people said were impossible. Um. And what do you say, and, and, and one of the things that I do like about, and I have to say I also enjoyed, um, uh, I read one of your reviews, the one where you gave yourself five different reviews uh, from five oh, different yeah. perspectives. But um, one of the things I do like about the book, too, is that you um, sort of uh, build in some of the critiques uh, that we you would get. Yeah. And so let's talk about, um, you, you sort of break down what conservatism is, is what liberalism is you say that conservatism is cruel yeah. that uh, liberalism is oblivious um walk us through that and then let's talk about sure. the conservative critique and the liberal critique for that matter of uh yeah. of the of this utopianism okay uh yeah so i mean conservatism i, I mean i describe it as as cruelty because i think even though every conservative is always saying no 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 it's just uh, we're just realistic, right? We just understand human nature. But in every generation, you find the conservatives uh, being the ones who rationalize and explain away and justify whatever today looks to us to be cruel and appalling. Um, and so I go through some conservative writings and you, and you find, you know, real justifications for like why people deserve their suffering or why it's okay not to care. Um, and, you know, there's, there's this famous book, The Rhetoric of Reaction, that talks about conservative rhetoric, which is all about, like, how every scheme for social improvement is going to fail. And they say that about anything, no matter what. So part of making progress is rejecting that kind of categorical belief that all attempts at social progress are, are destined to fail. And, I mean, I'm a pragmatist, I mean, and saying pragmatically, okay, well, that's not true. We don't, we don't want to adopt the conservative position here, you know, we do want to make social progress carefully, but we have to still believe in it. Um, now, liberalism, this is, a, you know, liberalism is a term that has applied to everyone from, you know, to Friedrich von Hayek, the classical liberals, to, you know, uh, Barack Obama, to Elizabeth Warren, to like, you know, so what, what, is it, what does it really uh, mean? Well, I, 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 I try and, what I do try and do is distinguish where the people who call themselves socialists differ from people who call themselves liberals. Now, they share a, often share a lot of overlap. There's more overlap between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren than there is between Bernie Sanders and Barack Obama or Bernie Sanders and a Amy Klobuchar, right? Um, but, you know, what is the dividing line that says that Elizabeth Warren isn't a socialist and Bernie Sanders is? Um, and one of the dividing lines is a, 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 a real antagonism to... As I said, class divides and the and hierarchy, right? So socialists have always been the ones that look inside the workplace and say, like, we need democratically controlled workplaces. We need to eliminate the distinction between owners and workers, landlords and tenants, right? So like a liberal is the one who wants regulation, who says that there should be, you know, rent regulation. We should, uh, you know, make sure that landlords treat their tenants well. The socialist is the one that says the idea that some people own the houses and the other people have to pay them rent 
Um, that whole distinction needs to eventually be broken down. Uh, socialists have always also been like because they have this workers of the world unite perspective. They have been way more consistently anti-war than people who describe themselves as liberal. And you really see that. that I mean, you were just talking about Iran. You really see that in the presidential candidates responses to the attack on Soleimani, which is like, you know, Bernie Sanders is very much more consistently anti-war um, and anti-American imperialism than any of the other candidates. I mean, you know, one of the things, I mean, just circle back around to, to the to, to the conservatism and the, and the human nature argument, which sure. I find fascinating, yes. is that um, there's a claim that we're just talking about human nature, but it really isn't just that. It is a it is a it is a moral judgment upon human nature, because if you just took yeah. human nature as it was, you'd accept that there are some people who are not going to be as materially productive as others. <laughs> right. Like that's just yeah. human nature. And you would accept that and simply say, still, still, they deserve a certain, uh, you know, basic level of human dignity that we all do or that we should all share one that is at least yeah. within certain bounds of being, you know, recognizable to each other. Uh, but the, yeah. the conservative mentality is, it seems to me, to um, exploit human nature and to perceive it as problematic uh, in some way. There's a kind of implicit social Darwinism that says that, like, people deserve what they get in the big sort of brutal competitive struggle. Uh, you know, Milton Friedman said, you know, ours is, our philosophy is not uh, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. It's from each uh, according to like what they are capable of producing in the market to what they're capable of producing in the market. But that what that means is that people who are um, like children, who are disabled, who are old, who are caregivers, they don't get any <laughs> any rewards, right? And we see that in the market. Those are the people who end up poor. Um, and so, like, there is this, and 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 the people who end up with the most end up being the people who are most willing to prey on and exploit other people. They're not actually the innovators, right? If you look at the the billionaires, they're generally not inventors. They're not people who who invent products for the most part. They are people who are capable of, as Peter Thiel says, cornering a market, getting between you know getting between people. Uh, you know, Peter Thiel invented PayPal, right? Which is just a middleman that siphons off some money. So they're those sorts of people. Um, you know, there's a real idea that not only are we motivated by self-interest, um, which is not true. Anyone who like knows people knows that that's just not really true. Um, you know, we're a cooperative species for the most part, except the libertarian. Um, and but that also but that self-interest is legitimate, like it is legitimate to solely pursue your own end. There is a stamp of approval on this human nature, this, this brutal human nature. Uh, and that stamp of approval allows us to justify, you know, anything you do that makes money is good. There's no distinction between price and value, right? Anything, the, 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 the amount someone pays for something, that's what it's worth. The amount that you're paid, that's what you're worth. If a CEO is paid, you know, 300 times more than their employees, it's not because they have just been able to exploit the nature of power relations in society. It's because they are 300 times more important and better. And so there's this sense that, like, power and strength kind of are virtue. <laughs> um, and that's, that's all, obviously very frightening. Right. Well, let me, I, I mean, I'm asking that because I want to sort of like, you know, uh, with that frame, right, with the social Darwinism frame and that and that sort of uh, the value and price frame. Right. Because like, you know, one could argue that uh, the reason why uh, CEOs are getting uh, 300 times, you know, X or whatever, whatever the, the, the number is. Right. The, the, the reason why the 10 million dollars is because there is um, there is a, a, a virus in the the market there's a flaw in the market uh, there's a um you know there's 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 a certain asymmetry and that it really the number shouldn't be uh 300 times x it should really be you know 100 times x uh or something uh to that effect and, and so um wh where on that spectrum wh when you describe liberalism what what is it there because where i'm ultimately going to this is like 
is there a precondition that you have to have in terms of a way that you view the world uh, to 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 be to be a socialist to have a socialistic perspective on things? But 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 talk about that the liberalism first. Yeah. So uh, well, I, I mean, I would say that if the difference between the rhetoric that you hear coming out of socialists and coming out of people who would be categorized as liberals on this particular issue would be, you know. Uh, Liberals would probably point out that, you know, this compensation seems unfairly high. Uh, we probably want to curb. But there would be a very strong appeal to uh, companies to regulate themselves. This is why you see, like, this business roundtable thing, which is, like, calling on corporations to be their best selves. Right. This um, is the I mean, corporate roundtable. Like, 50 CEOs got together and said, we can do better, guys. And I do mean guys. Yes. Yeah. We're good. We're we're the good corporations. You know, we're going to live up to our values. We don't fully accept that the only thing a corporation is supposed to do is maximize uh, shareholder value. There are stakeholders and whatever. The socialists are very critical of things like this because socialists uh, basically, as I say, want to dismantle like the the, the class division. So, like, even if a CEO is like a, a somewhat better person and gets a little bit less money. Um, they're still in within the workplace a, a dictator, right? I mean, it's still an undemocratic workplace. Um, Elizabeth Anderson has this great book, Private Government, about how corporations, if we conceive of them as private governments, which we probably ought to because people spend so much of their time being ruled by the rules of their workplace, um, the, the structure of a corporation is the structure of a dictatorship. You don't get to vote for your boss. There's no, there's no democracy there. If you don't like them, uh, tough. You know, your option is to leave just as in like a country. Your option is to like either migrate or stick around and put up with it. Um, and so that's kind of the difference between the way that a socialist looks at these, these, these things and a way that a liberal looks at it is socialists talk a, a ton about power. And, and who has it? And have you really changed who has power? And just because you've got the benevolent dictator, um, it, have you really solved the ultimate underlying problem? And the other thing that socialists say is that you, you, there's kind of a naivete to believing that you, you can solve things while keeping power relations pretty, pretty intact, right? So if you have, uh, a, if, if you have better CEOs, they might try and, and incorporate stakeholder interests or what have you. But ultimately, if a corporation is structured to where it's supposed to maximize shareholder value, there might be a, there's going to be a shareholder revolt if you go too far, right? right. The CEO of ExxonMobil, right, their job, like if they, if, they, if, they, if they can't come out and say, like, I think that what our, our company should be dismantled, Right. Uh, it's important that there are incentives. There are very, the reason that like the tobacco industry and the fossil fuel industry lied so much and manipulated the public was that they kind of had to. That was the nature of the institution. If you wanted to remain profitable, you had to find every possible way to keep the public from revolting against what you do. I, and and I, I mean, yes, I think that's uh, well put. I mean, it's it's nice that these 50 CEOs get together and decide that, you know, they're going to really make a strong effort to do better. Uh, but why do they get to choose? Like, why do they get to set the parameters? Um, you know, uh, why, you know, it's really just sort of asking, like, yeah. Why is it like this when it doesn't really have to be? I mean, uh, corporations do not exist in nature. They are a social yeah. construct. They are a, not even a social construct. They're a governmental construct. We the built state. The, They're made by the state. <laughs> um, the okay. state gives them limited liability and then enforces that. <laughs> okay, so does there, I mean, if a, a conservative is one who, in many respects, um, applauds this sort of top this 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 power structure because what it does right. is uh in some ways i mean really this doesn't i mean it's not that far from the monarchy right it's like it's blessed if it exists right. it exists because god wanted it that way we may have substituted yeah. the word market for god but the the market is moral god is moral uh if you're poor you're immoral if you um, if you if you lost the raffle, it's because God didn't want you to have the winning ticket, that type of yeah. thing. Uh, and liberals say like, well, 
we think our God should be a little bit more merciful. And so we're okay yeah. with the structure, but we want to take the rough edges off. Or we want to take a lot yeah. of the edges off, but the structure w- will remain. Yeah. If, uh, if, if socialists, uh, broadly speaking, want to um, change that power structure, does there need to be a precondition? Like, I mean, is this just simply something that you are born with or is this something that you i mean honestly like you know is it um in, in i mean do does there is this just something that you adopt intellectually uh yeah i don't i don't that's hard to answer right because that requires a bit of psychoanalysis um <laughs> i don't know why i mean i do know i talk about how like all the people i know who have been socialists have been people who really have this kind of deep disgust um, with so many systemic features of the world around them they see, right? And if, uh, I, another example, I think of the, the liberalism, socialism divide was I was thinking like, uh, if you lived under feudalism, liberalism would be like uh, minimum wages and maximum hours for peasants. And socialism would be like the entire idea of feudalism, of having power concentrated in the Lord. Is, is, is just wrong and despicable. And so I do think, like, I talk about how, like, socialists are kind of unreasonable people, right? I mean, Bernie Sanders, right? I, I, I used to not think he deserved the label socialist. I really come around to it because I, as you read the history of socialism, you see that a lot of the socialists, like people like Eugene Debs, are the people like Bernie Sanders who are standing there alone on the you know, floor of the house going, like, I will not tolerate another war. Um, they are people who have just like this, this uncontrollable discontent um, and this, this real feeling that something around them is very troublingly uh, wrong because they have that utopian vision, because they look at the world and they see the difference between what is and what could be. And that's why so, much, so many of us are so unpersuaded when people like Steven Pinker or Nicholas Kristof go like, but things are getting better on this chart. And you go, well... Things are getting slightly better on the chart, but actually the real measure is the gap between what is possible and what we have managed to do. And that gap might actually be growing all the time because, like, the more – as you increase production, as it's, as it's easier and easier to provide for everyone, it becomes more and more morally grotesque if you haven't. I mean, that is, I think, the um, – that is the nub, right? It's not where you are in a vacuum – it is where you are relative to where you could be based upon yeah. the potential or resources that and that you could describe you as an individual. It could describe you as a, a society or a, a planet for that matter. Um, I think that's a great point. So one of the things also I like about uh, what you've written is that you, you, you build in some of these critiques. What about I mean, why would we want to be like Venezuela? Where uh, yeah. oh, where God. we have a speaker of <laughs> former speaker of the house is trying to climb fences and getting kicked out of parliament. Um, why would yeah. we want that and or uh, address the critique that we wouldn't want the social safety net to become a hammock? Yeah. OK, well, the Venezuela thing, I mean, the, the challenge that I pose is like, OK, if socialism is a kind of. If economic socialism, right, which is distinguished from that kind of moral socialist instinct, is like uh, worker ownership, like was it worker ownership that was the problem in Venezuela? And the answer is no. It was authoritarianism. The problem was authoritarianism. And so authoritarian socialism is just as much of a problem as right wing authoritarian fascism. Authoritarianism really does destroy a country. And so that should be something that we all oppose, right, which is why I identify with what is called the libertarian socialist tradition. And those people have always been the ones who every time someone in the name of socialism, in the name of empowering workers, ended up crushing the workers, as Bakunin said, beating people with a stick but calling it the people's stick. Uh, We have said, no, the problem is that the state is beating people with a stick. So, and I, I mean, I also think that we, you know, it's, it's very cherry picked, right? Because everyone was looking at Venezuela while no one was looking at poverty reduction in Bolivia. Nobody looks at, at you know, the activities of socialists in the United States, right? Like 
Bernie Sanders was an incredibly effective mayor of Burlington. He's widely praised. He started a community land trust in the name of socialism. And is that, was he an authoritarian? Did he act like Lenin? No, he didn't. Um, you know, socialists ran the city of Milwaukee for many years. They ran it really well. So, you know, you, if you can't cherry pick. You have to look at the entire history of socialism and say, OK, there is a version of socialism that actually seems to do a lot of good. There is a version of something that is kind of a perversion of the ideal of socialism. And we need to reject that categorically. Um, the social safety net becoming a hammock. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because nobody asks this about capital income. Right. Nobody asks whether, like, the rich getting rich, richer off passive uh, passive income from capital uh, makes them lazy, right, which is so much more income. Uh, I, I mean, I really feel like, first, I'm not anti-hammock. <laughs> Hammocks for all. Um, it seems very, I mean, actually, though, I mean, the real serious answer is if you change the nature of work, so that work is really enjoyable, so that workplaces don't feel like dictatorships that you have to drag yourself to. If you really, I mean, there's nothing inherently miserable about being productive. It doesn't have to be that way. If you structure something, I mean, I, I'm a workaholic now. I come to work all the time because I have a job where, you know, we are a democratic workplace. We have very, a very good culture here at Current Affairs. Um, and everyone, you know, likes to work because we, you know, we kind of fix Because if you don't have a, a tyranny, if you're not working for the benefit of someone else, some tiny class of owners, but you're getting the rewards of what you do, um, then, then there is an incentive to work. And then it doesn't matter that you've got a safety net uh, because you've also at the same time eliminated the thing that is the disincentive to work, which is that um, actually having a job turns out to really, really suck when it's such a dehumanizing and alienating experience. Um, let me just uh, just uh, uh, get back to the sort of the, the Venezuela uh, question. What, what yeah. is, is it just a choice? I mean, is there a danger though, okay, of, of socialism, um, what you call libertarian socialism, uh, you know, or, or, or democratic socialism, let's say, right? Uh, sliding yeah. into an authoritarianism. Yeah. Like, is there, what, what yeah. is the ballast that, um, yeah. that, that keeps it from drifting into that type of, right. of scenario? Well, I think it should be the big lesson of the 20th century, right? Not that socialism is bad, but that, like, you need to build into your politics a way of avoiding the slide into authoritarianism and you know avoiding rationalizations for crushing dissidents the thing is that actually the socialists in the united states have a fantastic record on civil liberties they've always been the ones that have pointed out when the government is unfairly targeting dissidents now the question is would we do the same thing if we obtain power and the answer is you have to really make sure that your philosophy is very pro-liberty, is very pro-speech, is very pro-open debate and discussion, and is very anti-state violence. I mean, the thing is, like, socialists in the United States are mostly prison abolitionists. They're mostly anti-death penalty. They are mostly in favor of massively scaling back the militarization of the police. Well, if you value civil liberties and your worry is creeping authoritarianism, it seems to me like that's the team you should be on, is the team that is trying to release as many people from prison as possible. Right. And I guess we, we have, you know, theoretically at least, or I should say, uh, you know, uh, nominally, uh, some example of the potential dangers of authoritarianism in a country that is not socialist like this one. Uh, um, <laughs> right? I mean, that, so that's... funny because, like, we have the Gulag Archipelago. We've got millions of people. Like, we're the freest country in the world, and we've got so many people in prison, and yet people say, well, what about the possibility that you become a police state? My God, heaven forbid. Right. Um, uh, let's, um, uh, all right, let's move on to, um, uh, here's one more question I have on, on the book, and then I, I want to just talk a little bit about the election, because I know you've just written a piece about why Biden sure. is no good in the general, oh, yeah. and, and, and I want to ask you about uh, Warren and uh, and, and Bernie in that respect. But, but why do you think this is happening now? Like, why do you like, why do you think uh, the Jacobin is, you know, and, and, and I'm looking at uh, a, a polling that shows, I don't know, 11 uh, percent of Democrats, I think, 
um, uh, identify as as socialists, um, which I which I imagine is up. But certainly we know that a higher percentage of Democrats are OK with socialists. Um, and broadly right. speaking, um, we, 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 what do you think is has changed? I mean, is it is it is it generational? Is it a it's simply a function of the, the context of the times? What, or is it both? What, yeah. what is it? Well, partly it's generated. I mean, I talk about in the book, I talk about, you know, my experience growing up during the financial crisis and uh, during the Iraq war and watching people who were, quote, unquote, liberals and progressive Democrats supporting that war. And uh, and also like Barack, the Obama presidency radicalized the young, young people who sort of believed in it. And then they saw his foreign policy and then they saw his like uh, education reform, quote, policy. And they, you know, and 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 they're having his health care, you know, his compromises on health care. And then they realized, OK, well, I'm not a, clearly if this is what being a progressive Democrat is, I'm to the left of this. And then um, someone who called himself a socialist came along and said, well, I actually have, you know, much bolder plans. And they said, oh, OK, well, then that's if that's what socialism is, that's what I identify as. So I think Bernie Sanders made a huge difference to this um, because you saw the discontent in Occupy in 2011. You really saw like that was a lot of frustrated young people gathering and sort of, you know, talking about debt and talking about precarity and 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 the nature of work. Um, but it didn't sort of identify as a socialist movement. Um, and then it wasn't until Sanders' run uh, that you really saw like a lot of people coming together under the socialist label and the DSA's membership taking off. And I think it was because people began to see like socialism as a coherent vision for what an alternative would be. And yeah, it is mostly young people because young people are the most frustrated. Um, but so that, that's, how, that's how I would describe it. I'd say Bernie Sanders has a lot to do with it. And uh, and and also like the, the nature of growing up in, in this economy with the America's you know disastrous militaristic foreign policy hanging over us all the time. Yeah, I mean it's been fascinating just for, from my perspective because I I, don't, I you know the word socialism. I mean the people identifying in in American politics as, as socialists. I mean, and, and I say this as someone who who interviewed Bernie on my radio show in 2004. And, uh, you know, and he, the, when we talked about him being, uh, you know, a political independent, I think, but uh, a, a socialist. And, I mean, so he was out there. Uh, I don't even think, yeah. I think he was as surprised as anybody at how well he did in 2016, <laughs> frankly. Uh, and oh, yeah. I, think, I think maybe even too too late to realizing in that in the context of that race yeah. how well he was doing. Absolutely. Uh, um, and, and then suddenly it just caught on like wildfire. It's almost as if there was a tremendous amount of tinder on the ground. And he was, uh, yeah. him, um, you know, he, he just came up and lit the match again. And this time uh, the, the, the context was right. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, you kind of see a, a, a kind of an unfortunate parallel in Britain where like Jeremy Corbyn spent like 30 years as a backbencher that was suddenly elevated to the leadership, not because he was considered really the best leader, but because there was this tinder and it was like this, we need, we need the, everyone, this movement of, of young radical lefties. And I mean, it turned out like he, he really struggled to actually then deliver the kind of leadership that that mandate requires you to deliver. Um, I think Bernie's actually a much better politician, but it was the same kind of situation where like the undercurrents of the desire for an alternative was just waiting for someone, anyone to come along and say, like, I have it. Join me. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think um, in this instance, I mean, I think if there was a another version of Bernie, they would be more popular than Bernie at this point. I mean, I really I mean, like if there wasn't <laughs> if, 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 if there wasn't yeah. this sort of large gap between, um, you know, uh, people in their their 30s and, and, and Bernie in terms of like subscribing yeah. to these politics, I think that, um, you know, uh, th that person would be it w w would might be if, if there was, you know, if 
if Barack Obama... If he was 20 years younger, 30 years younger. <laughs> right. Uh, he would be yeah. defeating him, as it were. Or, or or she, more than likely, would be defeating yeah. him um, in that instance. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of... It's, 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 it's fascinating in that respect. All right, well, you know, um, I was going to ask you for the case as to why uh, Bernie Sanders... Um, uh, is is more electable than uh, than Joe Biden, but apparently Matt Iglesias yeah. uh, beat you to that uh, today. <laughs> uh, but but let's talk about Biden because I, I think you know okay. um, Biden's uh, and, and, and Bernie seems to be honing in on this right now too. Like this has been the unspoken belief, I think, frankly, of a huge swath of the democratic party i and i would include large segments of the establishment that joe biden is just ill suited to win and the perception by um a significant number of rank and file democrats uh and i would yeah. say probably the highest propensity voting democrats that joe biden can win and that's just speculation on my part um is 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 wrong walk us through that yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's understandable why so many prospective Biden voters like, default to the assumption that he's a pragmatic candidate, right? I mean, he was the vice president, so he he ran and won, you know, admittedly with Barack Obama in two national elections, and you know, he's been in Washington forever. He's got you know what they consider folksy appeal to win the Midwest and the Rust Belt or whatever. Um, I think it's, as you say, wrong, because if you actually look at Biden's performance in this campaign, it's not just, you know, many of us on the left are like, but he's rambling and incoherent. Well, you know, that's partially true. Uh, but it's also that he has nobody's really enthusiastic for Biden. And I think that really hurt Hillary Clinton in 2016. Um, and Biden has it worse. There were people who were enthusiastic for Hillary, but I don't know that anyone's going around knocking doors in the middle of winter, like dedicating themselves to Joe Biden. Uh, you know, it's kind of a joke, right? Uh, I, uh, he, so he has not really much of an operation. His fundraising has been really bad, while Donald Trump has a giant war chest building up. He doesn't really have a message beyond, like, Trump is a liar. Um, you know, that's no malarkey. Um, <laughs> so he's got no movement, no message, <laughs> no organization, uh, no, no enthusiasm. That's, that's bad, right? And he also has a bunch of really vulnerable spots, uh, just like Hillary Clinton did. I mean, Donald Trump's an anti-establishment candidate, uh, and Biden is like the definite. He's been in Washington since he was 30. Um, he's like he's involved in this like I mean this Ukraine thing, which like they say he didn't do anything wrong, but it looks it's like a mess. It looks bad. It's something you have to explain. Uh, it's easy to run against and say, like, Joe Biden's a representative of the corrupt establishment. Uh, Joe Biden voted for all the shit, and, uh, you know, says uh, he uh, didn't um, he runs against like the Iraq war. I mean, the Iraq war is the uh, uh, right. is the big thing that, uh, you know, Biden now has to pretend he has to pretend he has to lie and say that he opposed it. Right. Because he knows that this is such a weak spot. So he just goes around saying that he opposed the Iraq war from the start. And um, that's a massive vulnerability if the Republicans would just call you out on a massive lie that you're telling all the time, even as your whole campaign is why the other guy is a liar and I'm no malarkey, a return right. to honesty, dignity, and respectability. That, to me, that dynamic right there is is the biggest problem. It, it is the way in which he is most like... That the that the matchup between Clinton and Trump is most like the matchup between Biden and Trump because he Biden is running on character and that means that you are playing in a an arena regardless of whether he could have the greatest character or not it doesn't matter he's playing in an arena yeah. that is the only arena that Donald Trump knows how to play in which is. I am going to throw mud at your character. You're going to throw mud at my character. And then Donald Trump wins 
because he has a, you know, sort of like an adamant psychotic following who also know that he's going to deliver what is important to them materially, which is essentially a a Supreme Court and lower taxes. Those are the two things that they really you you fulfill the entire um, Republican wish list there. You know, you know, you have special interests who want like, hey, can you get rid of like the you know, uh, can I dump more toxins in the river? Sure, we can handle that. But that's not a you know campaign pledge. Um, but the bottom line is that is how you depress votes. You go after when you're, you're in the arena of character. I think that's what, what makes Sanders so strong as a candidate against Trump is that Bernie Sanders is not running on his character. He, I mean, you know, people can yeah. project stuff onto his character, but Bernie Sanders is never going up there saying like, you know, I'm going to restore dignity to the White House. I mean, I mean, he may have said it, but I don't think people associate it with him. He is going up there and saying, like, I'm going to do certain policies. And Donald Trump is going to say, you're a socialist. But the problem is, is yeah. that he, Trump does not have a next sentence to that. Yes, he I does, know. He can't even oh, explain I, I what that means. He can't say, like, you I, don't want to cut I, Medicare. He can't say anything I, after I'm that. I'm telling you. I tell you, everyone, should, I've dreamed of a Bernie Sanders debate against Donald Trump, right? Because, like, Bernie Sanders goes, we're going to deliver for you. Here's what we're going to deliver. You're, go- you're, you're never going to have to worry about whether you can afford your health insurance anymore. You're never going to have to worry about whether your kids can afford college, right? And what, is Donald, what alternative does Donald Trump have beyond the word socialism? He had nothing. And, so, and, and Bernie Sanders is going to run against the ideal character for him, which is a cartoon of, a, of an out-of-touch billionaire yeah. who doesn't care about anyone else. It's perfect. Um, and so he's the ideal anti-Trump candidate. Not anti-any Republican, but Trump yes. specifically. I just had like, I, I, agree. I just had a... Hun- a, a, a I, I, I agree. A, I mean, I felt this in 2016. He was like worried about like his family coming over and he's worried about like his paycheck with Uber. And I was like, Bernie Sanders has a message for that guy, which is we're going to fix immigration. We're going to fix your wages. Um, Biden has nothing. Biden has nothing to say to that guy. The, the irony is, is that I, I think that while Hillary Clinton could have beaten anyone else in the Republican field, I also feel that it's quite possible that anyone else in the Republican field could have beaten Bernie. But I just think that in terms of, and I'm talking 2016, but I'm talking in terms of matching up against Donald Trump, Bernie is the only candidate who clearly, and I think, and I want, I want to ask you a little bit about Warren before you go, because I think Warren, I I think frankly has, there's been a a misstep in her campaign. And I think that they, they, they didn't understand, um, you know, sort of, what lane she was running in. And they, 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 they tried right. to sort of become the compromise candidate and you don't become a compromise. You, 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 you are chosen <laughs> as a compromise um, on some level, but, but Bernie is oper- It's like two basketball teams. One that is, you know, playing a running game. The other is playing a post up game. It's like, you know, you, you, you don't play their game and Sanders uh, couldn't play their game if he wanted to. Uh, right. uh, 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 you know, and, and, and Trump has no ability to play any other game. Uh, Warren right. could have been that candidate, but, uh, but give me your, a sense of, of, of Warren's candidacy. Yeah. I mean, but it's frustrating because with Warren, like a lot, the one thing that you really need, if you're going to run against Donald Trump is you really need a powerful sense that you are authentic, that you're not a calculating Washington politician, Right. And Warren has done things that give a sense of inauthenticity, that give a sense that like she's trying to figure out what her (laughs) beliefs should be for the purposes of the campaign. Like, should I run? Should I say the word single payer? Is that good? Is that not good? Uh, Maybe I should just say Medicare for all and then kind of not say that it's going to be something that takes away private health insurance. Um, And that really hurts her because then people are like, oh, well, I don't trust you. Right. And, you know, I think it does hurt Warren that she has a long history of like changing her politics. Right. I mean, yeah, she spent 40 years as a Republican or or whatever. You know, she's a Republican until the 40s. Um, People can change. It helps Bernie, though, that he has been doing this since he was 18, getting dragged away from the civil rights protests. Right. With Warren, like, yes, she changed and evolved, but also like she's gotten much more radical for the purposes of this campaign. 
where she started talking way more like Bernie Sanders on a bunch of things. Um, you know, on foreign policy, she's very evasive. She has like I actually think the Native American thing is horrible for her because if authenticity is the issue, it's an issue where like she might have spent decades like kind of pretending to be a Native American without not being one. Like it, 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 it's it's going to really hurt her that like she doesn't have this this powerful sense of who she really, really is that Bernie Sanders is able to convey to people. And you can see in the way that they talk to um, voters who disagree with them. But I mean, Bernie's so good at like flipping Trump voters in like three minutes um, by getting them to trust him, by explaining like his core convictions. And, and they turn around and they come on board. Um, and I just like, I don't think Warren has this kind of organizer's mentality. I don't think she has the long... Uh, track record of fighting that is that she's going to be able to point to, and I think she's just like weak on a bunch of issues and waffling and vacillating in a way that is going to allow Trump to exploit it and is not going to play well with voters. I, I let me let me dissent a little bit from your from from your view okay. to a certain extent. I I think that she's I I disagree that she's inauthentic, and I and I think her policies have been have been r- r- pretty remarkably consistent and. Um, and, and she has been a fighter for a lot of these same values. I don't think she has the same take necessarily on power uh, that Bernie would, because. But I. But in the end, I'm not sure that from a from a, a you know a, a practical implication at this day and age, and this era w- would necessarily make a difference. I think the problem has been really just sheer political. Now I think like Bernie has an advantage because he can afford to not have political savvy because that's just not the kind of politician he has been his entire career. Like he hasn't had to be a politician because he hasn't been in a position where he is, you know, sort of like he just has one position and has been on that for a long time. And by political, I mean, she, I think made a political miscalculation in responding to the question, how are you going to pay for your Medicare for all? I think she made a, a political miscalculation in trying to present a plan as to how you're going to roll it out. Um, Bernie uh, has not uh, provided the level of detail in paying for it as uh, Warren has. And um, his uh, rollout plan, not, you know, the, the, the only thing that she, I think, made a mistake about was to say it was going to be in two tranches. She didn't need to do that. It was, there was, I think there is a uh, lack of, of, of confidence. Like there is, there, too many times we look at politics and say, what, 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 what lane are you going to be in? And we define that ideologically as opposed to what lane are you going to be in, in like strong and wrong or detail, you know, detail bogged down and 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 precise. Or there are other lanes that I think voters see. And I think that when she felt like she had to respond to, I don't. I think she was. I don't think that her her um, her belief that she was, um, you know, had a Native American ancestry was uh, nearly as egregious as the idea that she needed to respond to Donald Trump about it. F you, Donald Trump. Well, yeah, My mom told me that we were, you know, you, whatever. Everybody understands in this country some idea of like, uh, you know, well, I thought uh, we came from Hungary. It turns out I came from Poland. They, they sell all the 23 and me's based upon that. Right. Like everybody understands that concept. Yeah. Why feel like you have to address him to explain it? Why feel like you have to address anybody? Stick to your beliefs. Stay with it. And I think it it. It, it has become, at least in my mind, a concern about her uh, her political apparatus, which is developed by, you know, her advisors are picked by her. And at the end of the day, like uh, it, it, it shows a vulnerability that I'm, I would be concerned about in a general election. Um, she definitely responds too, mo- too much to Trump. I mean, you know, she rolled out her campaign with the DNA test video. Exactly. And I don't even know if the DNA test was supposed to be like, I am actually a Native American, right? Because the whole point of presenting a DNA test is you're right. Like, or she's not. Like, she's backing off. Like, well, she it, could, it, no, she clearly believed that she, she was. And so the idea being that, like, exactly, like, why are you responding to Donald Trump? 
the 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 only way you're going to beat Donald Trump is by showing the American public that this guy's a joker, and he's a joker by you yeah. don't you don't address him. Like yeah, go after yourself. Yeah. I don't need to justify anything to you, yeah. Donald Trump. And and frankly, we're in an era where we want our politicians to say we don't need. I mean, I think that's why Biden, frankly, to the extent that he has the support he does. Everything I find offensive about Joe Biden, I think, is part of the reason why he's doing as well as he does. Because he goes, you know, bless yeah. me, Father, for I have sinned, is his way of saying, go, go F yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's funny because I think, you know, many of the left criticisms of, of Biden aren't really landing because, like, the fact that he's rambling does mean that he's like, very much an unscripted politician, right? He's not robotic. You never know what's going to come out of his mouth. Uh, uh, that that kind of his like you know his, his confrontations with voters. They might, I don't know. They might actually help him. He's, he's got like a Trump like quality yeah. to him, which is to like go f yourself. Uh, I don't care what anyone thinks. But uh, anyways, uh, interesting discussion on that. But the real uh, point is, uh, folks, why you should be a socialist. Nathan J. Robinson, the editor of Current Affairs. Um, we will put a link to that at majority.fm. Um, I think, uh, this is a, a great, uh, uh, present to give to your, uh, to your, to your cousin or your, uh, your niece or nephew or your, your uncle or your aunt, uh, to push them over the edge. And now is the time. Uh, yeah. Nathan Robinson, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. A um, couple of uh, breaking news while we were uh, prosecutors have recommended Michael Flynn serve up to six months in prison. Uh, Trump's this, is, you will recall, he was the former national security advisor to Donald Trump, who was um, in the uh, lead up to, uh, I think, in the um, while uh, president, while he was the national security advisor elect, I guess you could say. Um, he was uh, trying to swing a deal where he would uh, kidnap a, uh, a Turkish uh, dissident cleric uh, and return him to Turkey, which, you know, he was doing it for cash. And uh, so why wouldn't you? Uh, with his son, I guess. They were going to do some type of Cobra style type of thing. And um, he uh, he cooperated with Mueller investigation. And then Dad. he came back and said, like, oh, no, actually, uh, they... Um, the, the government tricked me into cooperating, and so prosecutors just said, well, he's being a, a, a jerk off, so give him six months. CIA's just, like, deceiving you, Dad. <laughs> it, it's, we could have kidnapped that guy and got, like, $5 million and moved to Tora Bora. The deep state. What the hell? The deep state was out to get him. That same deep state that said uh, Soleimani is going to uh, attack us. Imminently. Yeah. He's also one of these, you know— uh, idiots who planted all these seeds about iran in uh, trump's head in 2016 if you read about michael flynn michael flynn is obsessed with iran yep. and might be also the guy there's an old medi hassan interview before trump announced where i flynn is ambiguous on the idea of killing terrorist family members so yeah he was a he was a really positive influence in uh, the trump world Folks, we got to take a uh, quick break and head into the fun half. We're a little bit uh, doing this, uh, went a little long today. Um, just a reminder, you can support this program by becoming a member, by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you become a member, you make this show possible day in, day out. And as a way of uh, saying thank you, we strip the ads from uh, the first half of the show, and then we give you extra content every single day. So uh, join the majority report dot com. Don't forget to also just coffee dot co op, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10 percent off. And uh, AMQ, the AM quickie, it's available on the majority app. And uh, it is also available at amquickie dot com, amquickie dot com. Five minutes every morning headlines so that you uh, know what your day is going to look like. And uh, every day. Uh, I've gotten some very good feedback on it that, uh, you know, people who want to maintain some touch with politics, but can't handle too, too much every single day. Uh, AM Quickie provides that for you. Uh, today is Tuesday. That means that uh, tonight, 
people are going to be messing up this table. Right? Isn't that right, Michael? Like no. crumb crumbs oh, from laden man. foods. Total fake news. Incredible. It's actually the other way around, which I have to clear off all of your coffee cups and your little various iced coffee situations. Sometimes I've literally come in here and there are two iced coffees in two different places on your desk. I like to have both one half here. Drift, I can both. do this and I can do like, you know, and the really like disgusting that. thing is the used toothpicks, which I have to work around. Oh, the toothpicks. Which is grotesque. Well, well, so. I, don't know, I don't know what you shouldn't be. What are you doing here over here? This is my, this, this area. Is well, my area. I, that's when I, the toothpick I have to deal with when I host on Thursdays. Right. So, All right. Yeah. I'll do better on Wednesdays. Yeah. You got to work on it. So thank you for giving me that opportunity tonight on TMBS. We're talking with Drew McAyel, who is a fellow at Queens University, about how the warmongering against Iran is affecting the social movements that were emerging across the MENA region, uh, and also, you know, the latest in terms of the escalation. Then Matt Chrisman is stopping by. He hasn't been on the show for quite some time. We're going to talk about sewer socialism or the end of the world. Judge Judy getting in on the Mike Bloomberg train. Andrew Yang, uh, not just his answer on health care, but really the just sort of total defeat that his politics represents, and a whole bunch more. Really excited about February 7th at the Bell House. This is the time I really want to start encouraging people to get your tickets. Um, Jam Pack Show, Alona Minkowski, Ben Burgess, Harvey K, Pretty Bad Bef a Lefty, Brandon Sutton, and um, actually Matt Binder. So there's some nostalgia to that show as well. You can grab the tickets. Uh, and of course, he hosts Doom, which is uh, which is great. Grab your tickets. There's a link on the Majority.fm homepage. See you tonight. Jamie. This week on the Antifada, we have an epic three-part series recapping the entirety of the decade, starting in 2009, just to be on the safe side, because I know some people aren't too sure where decades end and begin. Um, Don't appease them, Jamie. <laughs> Reject those people. Well, you know, it's also good to get a little bit of a prologue for whatever history that you're talking about. Uh, we have the very smart and funny Jake Flores and Simone Norman on as guests. We talk about so many things. Air, the Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, the Fappening, the 2016 election, the rise of the hashtag resistance, and more. And the third part of this is coming out tomorrow as a free episode. So check it out, folks. Patreon.com slash The Antifada. Brendan, you are not Matt. Literary hangover. Right now, he's yeah. reading a poem. Yeah, he's reading he? a poem. I was going to yeah. say, sell it. Doing some sort of epic, I guess. <laughs> George Orwell. I'm not sure which. This is Gilgamesh at six times speed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. See you in the fun uh, I have a plug. My band is playing oh! live uh, on Friday in Bushwick, if you're in New York. Ah! Yeah. All you um, Brendan heads. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, uh, gold sounds. Don't make it weird, I though. I knew there was something that I had to do this for. You want to say the location? babysitter for that. It's at Gold Sounds in uh, Bushwick. And uh, I was going to pull up the poster, but I forgot to do that. So I'll do that Thursday. That's awesome. But yeah, come check it out. All right. Let's see. Brendan, I'm putting that right in right now. All right. We can take a quick break. 646-257-3920. Uh, Is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half. 
3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Rand Paul. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. Uh, 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 wow. Uh, uh, um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is the uh, fun half. <laughs> ah. It's insanity. Here is uh, White House uh, Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham. You know, Stephanie Grisham, part of the White House that has been talking about the deep state, the Obama people. Get me out of office. She was the one that said the notes were be were left by the uh, Obama administration when they entered the White House, saying that they would fail. Oh well. yes, yeah. This is the one who lied three years into the administration. Like, oh, I'm I'm finally revealing. Incidentally, the Bush administration people did this too. They claimed that when they got into their offices, that all the Clinton people had pulled off the W's off of their computer keyboard. Ha uh, ha. Uh, pull off all the W's. And it turned uh, out that fuck was you guys. a lie. Just a complete fabrication. Uh, I, I imagine it's possible there was one oh, yeah. where somebody exactly. got the idea of it. The Clinton people are not funny enough to do that. No. and The Bill Clinton people might have been. They were... A little bit less lame than the Hillary. But so, I guess, what was it? A couple, like a month ago, Grisham comes out with this story of like, there were notes, mean notes from the Obama people saying- You're going to fail. Everybody's going to hate you. <laughs> Everyone get out your pants. Uh, right. Um, and so- I'd like everybody to sit down, think about the better natures, uh, angels of our nature, and then write, uh, you're not going to do so well on post-it notes. And then, <laughs> then, and then hide it. So they're still finding it three years later. Ideally, three years in, well, they're going to find one of these pink post-it notes going, expect your approval rates to be pretty low about this time. <laughs> did Grisham, did she even get into the uh, White House? Like, was she, has she been there since day one? Uh, I don't, I don't maybe know. She was a, uh, She's one of the ones I haven't heard but of. But here she is talking about how um, now is the time to trust the deep state. Can you specify the threats that Soleimani posed against American forces? No, that's, that's something. It was an intel-based decision, and it saved American lives. And I think that that's what's most important. I know a lot of people are now questioning the intel. That's really unfortunate. A lot of people are saying, to what benefit? And I will answer that question. The benefit was we saved American lives. We saved members of the military. We saved diplomats. And we saved a lot of families from having to uh, you know, welcome their, their loved ones home in uh, coffins. How long will you keep it private? 
That is not up to me. Uh, the members of Congress are being briefed tomorrow, so you know they'll they'll get to see that. I imagine some of those details will leak. But again, there's intel that just can't be made public because it's as safety for national security. Yeah, it's safety for national security. In other words, we can't talk about that whatsoever. It's absolutely, we would never, ever, ever leak that. Even if we had ironclad evidence, we would not show it to you. We would never do that because this White House is so professional and we are so concerned about security um, that uh, we, we talk on uh, unsecured cell phones all the time. There was a report uh, that one of the Iran advisors lost their computer in a honey pot that would be bad for national wow. security in many many um, ways you would like my snapchat sweetheart <laughs> i mean wait what kind of pictures is there anybody yes who for a single moment believes that if there was a shred of evidence that Suleimani was somehow involved in in an imminent attack on this country or Americans that we wouldn't have seen it by now? It was kind of weird that she asked for all of my national security documents on Dropbox in order to get the titty picture. But, you know, what are you going to do? She was hot. <laughs> you want me to leave my laptop in the middle of the Columbus circle? Okay. And now in, in a couple of days, they're going to be talking about how the, um, the deep state is the one who set up Donald Trump. That's why we can't hear from any witnesses. Right. It could be completely uh, wrong to hear from witnesses. And what, what really, real bag, the then really, when really what's going on is he's just doing this to beg and plead for Bolton to not testify. Um, Please, John, a bomb, John, a bomb, bomb, a bomb holy sites. How about that? Anything I could do to destroy Iran? How many countries do I need to blow up for you not to testify? Fine, John. You'll have your wars. What do you want? We can um, nuke Cuba. Ron Johnson is arguably one of the most mentally challenged members of the Senate. And, As in he's incredibly stupid. Uh, I will remind you, it was Ron Johnson who... <laughs> who basically said that he went to the president because um, Sunderland, the EU ambassador who was then sort of freelancing as the Ukraine uh, ambassador, had gone to Ron Johnson and said, hey, we got a problem. Trump won't release the funds to Ukraine unless they announce that they're going to investigate Joe Biden. And Ron Johnson went on TV to relate that story and say, so I called the president and I just want you to know the president said there's no quid pro quo without realizing that Ron Johnson was actually backing up the testimony before Gordon Sondland actually testified that the ambassador to the EU was told there's a quid pro quo, just not in so many words. And then he realized like, oh, I got to backtrack from that. Did I just, oh, I, that came out wrong. Here is a Ron Johnson Talking about how um, the impeachment process is really, really interfering with Donald Trump's ability to wag the dog. I like this idea of this hanging out uh, over him during an election. That, that, that would be kind of a strategy or on the part of the Democrats, albeit a weak one. Or but so how, how do you avoid or that? Or during a crisis in Iran. Right. Laura, there's been so much damage already been done to this country uh, because of this. You know, the, the, the fact that now any future president will have a hard time having a candid conversation with another world leader because, because we've exposed these, these transcripts. And, and, of course, within two weeks of this president taking office, conversations between world leaders were leaked. I don't know who President, trust can, president Trump can trust inside the administration. Think of that. Well, he, so, he, so still, has people, he that still has people on the National Security Council you know, detailee staff who are working uh, security council, you know, detailee staff who are working. So we're, we're having a problem with that, but, um, that are work, what that worked for Obama. Is that what she was saying? No, I think he's still saying that she, he still has some people that maybe he can tr uh, rely on inside well, the staff level here. Here's the amazing thing about what Ron Johnson's saying here. One, a crisis of Donald Trump's making is what is problematic. 
Here, go ahead, pull this up. Inside the administration, think of that. Well, he, he, still, has people, he that still has people on the National Security Council, you know, detailee staff who are working against his policies. Burrowed in right now, yeah, they're you, there. You, you take a look at the news stories that came out after the, the uh, missile attack against uh, uh, General uh, Soleimani. General Soleimani. Um, and yeah, there, there, there's still people leaking inside the administration trying to undermine his policies. Um, What's amazing about this is that here is Ron Johnson saying, like, how can you have this impeachment when Donald Trump is trying to create a crisis in Iran? It is like that. It's too much on Donald Trump's plate. And then on top of that, like, I want to remind people. The big one of the big selling points of Donald Trump was that he is a businessman. He only gets the best people. Do we remember that? Only the best people. Oh, yeah. And Ron Johnson's complaining that and there's only like four or five people who are allowed to listen in on these conversations, all of who are handpicked by Donald Trump, that are leaking stuff. Well, it's because Donald Trump is a joke. And all the people around him are all scumbags. And there's no loyalty amongst thieves. And, the, you know, the bottom line is that this doesn't in any way prevent future presidents from having frank conversations with other world leaders unless they are frank about wanting to personally enrich themselves. Let's take politics fashion. out of this for <laughs> one second, Samantha. Say a president that you prefer is in office and they want to open up a chain of halal restaurants in another country. <laughs> opened by them and their children. You would preclude their ability to have a freight conversation with, as an example, an Al-Qaeda affiliate in Karachi they are trying to partner with. I'm, I That's am, why you need to look beyond your own partisanship. I am concerned about uh, Bernie Sanders being president and trying to negotiate maybe with, like, uh, the French some type of, like, um, you know, I've got a snow uh, a ski resort in, in Vermont that I want— uh, you guys to 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 call try to open the up a chain of Montessori <laughs> schools with the French. I need to be able to have a frank conversation without the deep state. God. It's arts education for people who come from abused backgrounds, and if I can't, if I can't have a secret conversation with the German Social Democrats about it, the deep state is one. The utter dumbness of these people has got to add some insult to the injury. I mean, to be fair, Ron Johnson is like the king of the dumbness. Yeah, Ron Johnson is like, super... Ron Johnson is literally a rich guy who inherited, like, you know, some family fortune and, like, read an Ayn Rand book and was like, oh, I should be in the Senate. Like, Soleimani, good or bad, was an objectively impressive person. And to get murked <laughs> I, I by mean, people like this is got to be... The worst yeah. end you could possibly meet. I don't know. I didn't meet him. I wouldn't necessarily call him impressive. I wasn't impressed by him. I'm not impressed by many people. So I, maybe. I, I just think it's funny that Ron Johnson, like each point he brings up, this was something that Trump brought upon himself. Like we can't do future exactly. diplomacy because these transcripts were released. Who released these transcripts? Exactly. It was the White House. Now exactly. He released the transcripts. Yeah. And. <laughs> Why did he release the transcripts? Because there was a burgeoning scandal he thought he was getting out in front of that he created. He created the crisis in Iran. All of it. All of it. In fact, it was Ron Johnson who precipitated the release of those transcripts because he went on and was too stupid to realize that he was in the middle of blowing the lid off the, the entire scandal. And I will say... Taking the word impressive out of it, if uh, we don't want to use that word, uh, Ron Johnson or Donald Trump could not handle General Soleimani's schedule for more than a half an hour. That, uh, that may mean, be the Ron Johnson, be the Johnson would be like, what, 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 General Johnson just leaked intel from Kud's operations by accident across the entire but Middle East this again. Is a, a comical and mismatch. Donald here. Trump would have a, a cardiac arrest walking up the hills to meet right. with people. That, right. Like, but I, but I, let me put this <laughs> way. Look, 
Uh, Bob Kerry, former senator from Nebraska. Not impressive. Not, not impressive, despite the fact that he also uh, was involved in a lot of uh, he was what not a strategist war though, crimes. The war. Yeah, he uh, uh, and and so I, you know, I just um, they're walking up the hills, right? And, and Trump, Trump's like, you know, a lot of people are going to meet with the Kurds soon to organize an insurgency, but a lot of people think that Robert Givens left Mike Tyson for Brad Pitt. It's not true. <laughs> left him for me. <laughs> he starts panting heavier. <laughs> Let's um, here is uh, Bernie Sanders uh, on with Anderson Cooper. And there there are two things that lead me to believe that uh, Tuesday's uh, debate is going to be a little bit more fireworky than we have seen in the past. And um, part of that is that. Um, OK. Yeah, let's start with eight um, that. Elizabeth Warren has written uh, a piece on um, that they have posted now about the, the history of the bankruptcy bill and Joe Biden, which has been a long time coming. I suspect that she should have done this a while back, frankly. Uh, and, 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 and notice the way that Sanders does this. I think it's interesting. And I think that, the, that this is something that Warren should have done about the bankruptcy bill in the past. The critique, the substantive critique is actually just spoken in support of a pragmatic critique. The pragmatic critique is uh, Joe Biden is going to have a tough time against uh, Donald Trump. And then Bernie outlays the substantive critique. The substantive critique is one which I agree with. But there are people who may have a problem with the substantive uh, critique. And so Bernie's uh, very smartly uh, delivers this as really making a pragmatic argument about electability because Donald Trump will surely bring this up. Elizabeth Warren could have done the same thing with the bankruptcy bill. Avoided to be seen attacking Joe Biden by talking about how Donald Trump will attack Joe Biden. Even though what you're also doing is attacking Joe Biden. Joe Biden voted and helped lead the effort for the war in Iraq, the most dangerous foreign policy blunder in the modern history of this country. Joe Biden voted for the disastrous trade agreements like NAFTA and permanent normal trade relations with China, which cost us millions of jobs. You think that's going to play well in Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania? You know, Joe Biden has been on the floor of the Senate. Uh, talking about the need to cut Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, Joe, Bi Joe Biden uh, pushed a bankruptcy bill, which has caused enormous financial problems for working families. Uh, wait, what's going on? Is that, is that the, only, the entire clip? Where's the part where he says uh, Joe Biden is a good guy? Is that it? Well, that's the way he introduced it. But anyways, that's where he's... Sorry, the, yeah, the, yeah, idea the full is that, clip is he says he is genuinely a friend of mine. Yes, I really do like him. The idea is that uh, Sanders is making it as if he's not attacking Joe Biden. All he's doing is outlining the litany of attacks that will come at Joe Biden and why he's vulnerable in the general election. And very uh, smart. It's, it's a very effective way of doing it because... You're, you don't have to argue the merits of the bankruptcy bill. You don't have to argue the merits of cutting Social Security and Medicare. You don't have to argue the merits of the Iraq war or even whether it's salient. Now, I happen to think it does, and many, many people listening to that happen to think it is. But the reality is that, um, yeah, here, here's the front part of that. Joe and I are friends, and, and I truly like Joe. But what is imperative is that we defeat Trump, the most dangerous president in modern history. And that means you're going to have to have a huge voter turnout. You're going to have to get working people excited. You're going to have to get young people excited. Joe Biden voted and helped lead the effort for the war in Iraq, the most dangerous foreign And so on. Uh, there it is. I mean, so he's setting up this uh, uh, attack on Biden as if... He is really, in some ways, like just giving warning to Biden, like here are all your liabilities in the general election. Both things are true. The substantive attacks that he is launching on, uh, on Biden, the vulnerabilities are, are problematic for Democratic primary voters. 
But he is going now at the pragmatic uh, belief that Joe Biden is somehow a better candidate in the general election. And he is clearly not because of those things. Right. Every one of those things that Sanders has outlined should not only be problematic for Democratic voters, hopefully they are, but if they're not, they're also things that Donald Trump ran on in 2016. They're precisely right. And then that he's going to get up there and go like, Joe, thank you for the bankruptcy bill. That helped me out when I was a businessman, but I'm not a businessman. That's exactly. And then Uh, Joe and then Biden will even turn around and say, like, this is the guy that wants to cut Social Security and Medicare. Well, okay, but here's more video of you. Bernie just the lineup is perfect. There just is not a single area where he can't just say, like, I, as I mean, as Nathan Robinson said earlier, right? Like I've been fighting against what you individually personify my whole career. Mm-hmm, it's a clear choice. Burnett. I'm glad he went after him on trade as well, because we've been saying all along, Biden is vulnerable on trade. I think sometimes people underestimate the impact of trade deals like NAFTA on swing states in the Rust Belt that are going to be especially important in this election. And I hope Bernie keeps going with that line. Um. Here's another while we're on the Joe Biden um, liability train. It's clip number nine. Joe Biden's in Iowa. This is not a good look for uh, for Joe Biden. Um, he is confronted with the limitations of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it has proven to be durable in terms of pol- politics in part because the Republican Party have literally no response to what could replace the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I would argue that the the two best features of the Affordable Care Act, the PPI and uh, ACA is what it's really called, and that is the Patient Protection uh, the, and Affordable Care Act bill. The Patient Protections terms of no rescission, no lifetime, uh, no yearly uh, limits, um, et cetera, on your thing till 26, and specific um, uh, definition of what constitutes health insurance in the same way that, like, you can't sell a car if you're a car dealer that has no engine. So, well, it's a car. I I saw you wanted a car. Here's a car. You should have test driven it. You don't want the freedom to buy a car without an engine. Right. Exactly. Like that is. (laughs) And incidentally, it is a thousand pages. That was the uh, Republican uh, counterpoint to that stuff at the time. And the other benefit, of course, was the expansion of Medicaid. The problem is that the ACA part, the Affordable Care Act part, the Affordable Care Act part didn't pan out. And uh, so here is. Real quick policy question. My understanding of it, going back to reading Jacob Hacker, who I think is one of the core conceivers of this, and this is why public option, in addition to being what we want ideologically, was technically necessary in order to keep costs down. The public option, and also there was a big loan program, a government loan program for uh, nonprofit uh, insurance companies, not companies, nonprofit insurance to be developed by states to enter in there. And there was also a waiver with the hopes that certain states would do um, a Medicare for all. Vermont was going to take advantage of that and then chickened out because they hadn't set up the taxes properly or the argument for the taxes properly. But yes, the public option was the, was the theory that um, this is what's going to keep costs down there. But, you know, ultimately, um, the problem is that there was just no real cost containments. And the public option, I think, for a lot of people was like, this is the put the toe in the door to a, uh, a, a sort of a single payer type of system. But here is Joe Biden being asked a question by, you know, what looks to be, um, uh, I want to say a kid, but he's probably a young early 20s, uh, asking Joe Biden a question. During the run up to the passage of Obamacare, President Obama promised my father that if he likes his plan, he can keep his plan, and that his insurance will be cheaper. After passage, his plan was no longer allowed, and his insurance costs doubled. Since you supported the plan, were you lying to my dad, or did you not understand the bill you supported? The lying dog face pony shoulder. No, look, there's two ways people know when something is important. One, when it's so clear when it's passed that everybody understands it, and no one did understand Obamacare, 
including the way it was rolled out and the gentleman's right. He said you could keep your doctor if you wanted to and you couldn't keep your doctor if you wanted to necessarily. He's dead right about that. But what? what? Where is he going? Is there, is there more to that? Wait, is, is, did he just admit he did not understand, like, the s- flagship policy of the administration he was a part well, of? Well, I don't know what. I mean, he's not explaining anything. He's not. He's. I, I, I don't know, like, where. Is there any more? There's no more to that clip? Um, there's no. There's. There's nothing else there. He doesn't have an ability to articulate. Now, I have a feeling that question is a little bit dicey. I mean, it's, it's loaded. And I just want to, I mean, look, this is like one of the, you know, this is uh, tricky with how things are, are, you know, cut these days and how things go viral. There was something that with Biden from a week ago that was just straight up misleading and dishonest that people were trying to send around. But in cases like these, where it isn't like a cut, Right. Like it's truncated, but the main bulk is there. He doesn't know how to answer that question. Right. And he's handing them ads. Right. So even if he pivots and makes a spirited defense of X, Y, and Z that they achieved, great. That's all you need. You got a question, whether or not it's dicey or not, it certainly reflects, you know, valid complaints in people's experience. And the off the cuff is no one understood rollout was bad (laughs) and here is a specific quote which can be used for dozens of different ads i mean this is these to me those clips are really we're just in the terrain of like it's not about policy this is about somebody that is showing that it's it's a huge risk to put them up against donald trump calling from a 210 area code who's this where you calling from 210, going to the phones. It's John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. What's up, John? Yeah, Bernie Sanders continues to have excellent polling results in Iowa and New Hampshire. According to the latest YouGov poll in Iowa, uh, Bernie's tied with uh, Biden and Buttigieg with 23 percent. Warren's dropped down to 16 percent. There are 1,681 precinct caucuses in Iowa, and if Warren does not hit the 15 percent threshold, she will be excluded from the second ballot. Many of her voters will probably switch to Bernie. According to the last Morning Consult national poll out this morning, 33% of Warren supporters' second choice is Bernie, while Biden only gets 24%. When asked about uh, uh, their enthusiasm, Bernie leads all candidates with 67%, which is higher than the average of 56%. Biden only gets 49%. 36% of Bernie's Iowa supporters say this will be their first caucus. 538 misidentified this poll as a likely voter screen when it's actually a registered voter screen with 19% saying they're not likely at all uh, to vote uh, in the caucus and 5% saying it's too soon to say. In the 18 to 44 age group where Bernie so dominates. So what are the implications of that? Wait a second. Wait a second, John. What are the implications of that? That you have registered voters with 19% saying they're not likely to vote. Those are, are those are, are, are we seeing their preferences, though, or, or are they just excluded when they say they're not likely to vote? No, they're not excluded. That's why I'm saying it's not a likely voter screen. And so uh, so like the actual the 18 to 44 percent, uh, you know, 84 percent of those people say that participated in the poll say they're likely to. Uh, to vote to only 73% of 45 and older are likely to vote. So that means that the Bernie supporters are more vote motivated right. to vote. And so so if, if a likely voter screen is put in place, there's no doubt that Bernie would have a lead instead of uh, being tied. So the, the ratio yeah. of under 45 voters to, to older 45 voters in this 200, uh, 2016 Iowa exit polls you know, are 63 percent for voters uh, 45 and older and 37 percent for voters under 45. So a five percent, five point increase could re- uh, among younger voters would be could huge. really help Bernie. Yes. And, and I've been yeah, saying absolutely. this. I've been a broken record about this for the past three or four months. And that is that if the Sanders campaign theory is correct, 
the polling is going to be off by a significant amount, right? Because they are bringing in people who most of these likely voter screens will not be catching and that um, will not be catching to their full extent. Let's put it that way. And, um, and I think, you know, that's it's going to be interesting to see what happens after that, because um, a lot of people, I think, are going to question <laughs> their their polling if if Sanders is successful in the theory that uh, they are running on. And it's starting to look like that is, um, you know, we, we have no sense until the day of, but it's starting to look like that, that, it, that it's very possible. Right. I mean, caucuses are always the most difficult to poll. In fact, many, you know, them in 2016 weren't polled at all or polled extremely sparsely it's just because it's just, you know, it's not it's not worth the pollsters time and money right. because the, 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 the results are so bad then they look bad. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, in 2016, only 7.7 7 of all eligible voters in the state turned out for the Democratic caucus. Well, let's say in New Hampshire, the Democratic primary, around 26% turned out for the primary. And that's all, all eligible voters, uh, which, which was a record for turnout in the percentage in the 2016 Democratic primary. Like, so like you said, there's a lot of room for improvement. So the Democratic Unity Council came to an agreement after the 2016 election. The number of caucuses where Bernie dominated in 2016 were reduced by 10 states. And in return, superdelegates uh, would not be allowed to vote on the first ballot. Uh, they will only come into play if a candidate receives less than 50 percent of delegates. And the magic number for, that, for a candidate to win on the first ballot is uh, 1,990 delegates. So I've talked a lot about a brokered convention since the beginning of last year, but with Bernie doing so well lately and Warren and Buttigieg, you know, dropping in polling, uh, you know, it may just be a Bernie and Biden race. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, Biden, Bernie leads in projected delegates in Iowa and in, in uh, New Hampshire, according to YouGov. Now, according to Doug Johnson Hetlam, a Bernie supporter who also writes about elections, Bernie will be at 499 delegates, you know, uh, after Super Tuesday, Biden 627, Warren 317. So, again, you know, in every single projection I've seen, if they if Bernie and Warren combine their delegates, uh, you know, Bernie will will be the candidate, you know, I mean, since he's right now is definitely overtaken Warren. So. Uh, uh, so you know where it's all. You know it's. You know it's going to be the big, uh, the big prize, right? You know what it's going to be, right, John from San Antonio, right? Tell me. You tell me, John from San Antonio. <laughs> are, are you talking about Texas? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you need yeah, to I deliver mean, this, this, Texas for Bernie, John from San Antonio. It's up to you, buddy. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, definitely. if 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 well, if Bernie overperforms in Texas, regardless of what's happened up to that point, if things go more or less as as like, you know, they appear they might, that's going to be that's going to be the real problem for for Biden. Cuz he's going to lose handily in in California, and it's going to be Texas that's going to uh, mitigate that. Unless you, John from San Antonio, deliver for Bernie in Texas? Well, I mean, Super Tuesday, uh, I mean, the thing about California is you're really not going to know until three to four weeks what the actual numbers are because John, they have mail-in that's ballots. True. That's true. John, this is Bernie so, Sanders. I mean, John, this is Bernie Sanders. I have a special message for you. 2019 was a big year for you. You've become a main contributor on the majority report. You humiliated Samantha Cedar with your call of the uh, impeachment process, where, frankly, he embarrassed himself, and you approve it right at every turn. Can you play a significant role, and it's a big role, in 2020 in securing Texas for us and proving Sam wrong once again? <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that the, the South 
is going to be, you know, super. I mean, that's the only way Biden is, can win is if he dominates in the South. I mean, that's the only way because he, when you look at Bernie's momentum, and so much is going to be about the momentum. Will his momentum from Iowa and New Hampshire carry over to Nevada? Uh, uh, Nevada, rather. And, I uh, think so. You know, I, and then when, when Super Tuesday comes, you know, I mean, there are a lot of southern states. You know, it's uh, the Texas is the second, uh, you know, highest delegate total, and then North Carolina's third, uh, and uh, Virginia's uh, uh, fourth. And then uh, Massachusetts. All is right, well, fifth, John, John and, we gotta go. We gotta go. But uh, get get on that. Uh, Texas. Okay. I just want to say, uh, like uh, people should remember that uh, I believe I think Joe Biden said years ago something odd about Delaware being a quasi Southern state that people should look up. Call him from a five eight five area code. Who's this? Where you calling from? Five eight. Who's this? Hi. Come from 585. Oh, this is... Hi, this is Annie in Upstate. Annie in Upstate. Rochester. Happy New Year. What's going on, Annie? Yeah. Well, um, I was thinking about... Well, I was on Twitter. Uh, you know, I'm very online, apparently, to, you know, these days. And I, I see that, uh, honestly, I think we might be able to avoid the constant drumbeat to war with Iran because, in general, I think the... Um, fear of the, quote, deep state and all of this QAnon stuff and the Trumpers especially, they're in a they're in an anti-establishment, anti-state sort of fervor. And then all of a sudden, you know, they can't switch gears fast enough to fall in line. It just seems like um, they didn't get their, their ducks in a row in order to um, beat the drums of war because... You know, everything I'm seeing is it's pretty quiet on the rah rah. Let's go to war with Iran front. It, it, you know, this is maybe just my opinion, but if you're gonna uh, spend, you know, two years um, saying don't listen to the media, you know, shun experts, uh, all these people are liars. You can't trust the CIA. You can't trust, you know, the FBI. And then you turn around, and then all of a sudden you're like. Oh, uh, you know, suddenly um, we should go to a uh, war with, uh, you know, a very powerful enemy. And you guys need to all fall in line and start believing all the, uh, these experts all of a sudden. The, 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 I guess I want to say like the horses are out of the barn on that one. These well, people are not uh, in that mode. You know what I mean? That's an interesting uh, um, take on that. I, I appreciate it. I mean, I think uh, thanks for the call. I think, you know, I think there's some truth to that. I also think that like... <laughs> There's been no groundwork laid for this at all. I mean, this is the point we've been trying to make, is they're trying to make um, Qasem uh, Soleimani the uh, the world's number one terrorist and threat to America. And, the, you know, Brian Kilmeade is talking about this guy as if he's uh, a public enemy number one. He hasn't said him more than once on his radio show and on his TV show in, 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 in years. Well, they have in, like, the real crazy, I mean, you know, you you it that's why he was asking trump about him back in the day but i i think what's really important though is to distinguish the there's two different things here in it's another i think useful difference um to make with inside people who voted for trump i think andrew basevich is totally right that what he said yesterday and there was some interesting numbers on uh on on places that had higher concentrations of people coming back from afghanistan and iraq that there were some people that voted for Trump, definitely. I think that the isolationist message resonated with them. But I think the people that are really in on like QAnon and stuff, it's the same way that when Trump, I was just talking about this with a friend, Trump went on Alex Jones for the first time and Trump, you know, being the idiot he is, he just sort of, you know, we're gonna need a lot more surveillance, need a lot more surveillance to end terrorism. And this nutcase who has been ranting about surveillance for ages you know what i mean and the government is planting chips in us and this and that doesn't blink an eyelash and i think some people might think that that's a contradiction but it isn't because they're authoritarians it's it's, it's just... author it's well and it's like surveillance for that for thee and not for me like right. it means like i'm my liberties are threatened because of uh of a uh, light bulb changes 
but mass surveillance on Muslims is necessary for security. So yeah, don't forget the low flow toilets. I think there's a big <sighs> difference between some. I think there's definitely people who gravitated towards Trump. Definitely not a major, majority, but absolutely there are people. I I wouldn't be shocked if some you know. I think there's people in the Andrew Bacevich lane who might have preferred uh, Trump into Clinton in some ways, right? But that is very different than the people who think that, you know, John Kennedy Jr. and Trump are both going to pop up and right. reveal a global criminal ring. And they probably are just authoritarians that are going to listen to whatever is said. Um, this is pretty funny. You know that guy, Andrew Claven? Do you know who he is? He's no. like the... The, I don't know where they dug him up. Is he from. a lawsuit? You no, know, he's on the Daily Wire. With, oh, I have no idea. This guy. This guy. Like, I've we, seen we've him, seen but him I don't before. Know he... I don't know where he came from, but uh, he he does his show in internet the internet based research. Um, the you know this the the Shapiro network here, and um, here he is. You know they they want they they there is a a, a Breitbartian, you know streak at the daily wire that's where ben shapiro came from um and so they know or at least they believe they know that politics is downstream from culture so they do a lot of like um i guess he's a writer of uh, a, a crime cultural novel. critique shall we say yeah and um he is uh oh he is he is much older than me uh brendan and uh, but this is this is probably where I'll end up being something like this, you know, in like 10, 10 12 years. Uh, doing What's happening like with the lighting? Well, yeah, here is Republicans always talk about culture when they're in office. Can I have my, Listen my to this. teeth back? There is apparently a show called The Witcher. Right? I don't know where where, where is this where is the show on? Is it? A, a, it's like it's on Netflix. A Netflix show. This is Netflix is apparently a streaming service that you can get um, like movies and shows on your TV through the Internet. Yeah, it's like straight to video. But instead of a cassette tape, it's over the Internet. Now, That's what I, my understanding, people have like basically guys. thrown out their VHS. This whole show is and, like that. And you can stream it. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But there's a lot of women telling jokes. So it is good and bad. He is the guy who who who. <laughs> Who has the theories about women, I think, in comedy. But it's not just comedy. Oh, I bet. This is just, this is really stunning. So The Witcher is a show which uh, follows the story. Well, let's listen first to his critique of The Witcher. And then I'll tell you what the story is of the show. And so the lady who made the, the show, the showrunner, uh, Lauren Schmidt, history show, now she was going to pay attention to the women. And immediately I was put off by the fact that there's a queen in this who fights like a man. And there's a couple of scenes where women fight with swords. And I just hate these scenes because no woman can fight with a sword. Zero women can fight with a sword. And what I mean by that is in a situation where you are fighting men who are used to fighting with swords, you are going to get killed if you were a woman fighting with a sword 100% of the time, right? Now, you can a, a woman with a sword could kill somebody. A woman with a sword could kill somebody who doesn't know how to fight with a sword. But in a war situation where you are swinging this 5 to 10 pound sword again and again and again against much, much, much stronger men, they are going to kill you. So when you write a woman who uh, fights with a sword and this queen is... She's a man. They should have made the character a man. She's a man. She's uh, gross, and she swaggers around, and she rips into the you know uh, meat and tears it with her teeth, and then and curses people out. She's a man. So uh, it was like it was this feminist statement. And I just thought, please give me a break. And I don't know if that's in the book, uh, in the books, but it it just I just thought, give me a break. This is not the way any woman behaves. Okay. Now, first off. I'm sure that Clavin has spent a lot of time in battle, uh, with, you know, with, with swords. D&D &D campaigns, for sure. Uh, without a doubt. But wait till you hear the context in which he finds it so unbelievable that a woman could be fighting, uh, fighting with a sword. You ready for this? What is The Witch about? The Witch is set in a medieval fictional world on a landmass known as The Continent. And it follows the story of a solitary monster hunter, Geralt of Rivia, sorceress Yennefer of Vernonburg, and Cintron Princess Ciri, who find their destinies tied together. So the, the monster, that I can believe, 
the sorceress, the one who can do the magic, no problem. But the idea that a woman could have a sword, it just takes me way out of the show. Exactly. It just takes me way out of the show. I can't believe that. It's just like impose your feminism on this uh, on this show. Like, first of all, <laughs> the it's this feminist version uh, that uh, a woman with a sword could defeat a monster. Of course you can't. They're monsters. Sounds like someone's got a big old crush on the sword lady. The one Honestly, that's going though, on and on about her. She's like practicing sword play rent free inside his head. Do I mean don't you don't you stop if you're this guy for one moment and go like, oh, I'm gonna say this publicly. That in this like fantasy world where there are monsters and witchcraft, that the thing that I can't buy into is that there's a woman who's who's good at a sword fight. Well, you can only suspend your disbelief so far. I know. That's just that's just a bridge too far. That's just a bridge too far. There is something really like, and I, I, here's the thing. If you're going to be doing the, um, the, the, if you're going to be doing the uh, culture is downstream from, uh, or is upstream from politics thing, you may not want the 65 year old guy who could just can't uh, suspend his disbelief about a woman with a sword. Uh, in the fantasy show because the culture you're going to be reaching I got really bad news for you they're not going to be around in 10 years I might actually watch this show now I mean, I hope like you don't, a fun romp hope you don't spend the last years of your life worrying about that shit <laughs> yes <laughs> Jesus that's, you're on that's your the deathbed, one. you're just no saying, way. I wish I spent more time with my family, more time <laughs> litigating the credibility of sword fighting shows and streaming services. This, uh, 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 it, yeah. You know, everyone. Although I get the priorities. feeling that his family might be excited. Yeah, I was going to say, hey, 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 dad, look, look, there's a broad sword <laughs> fighting. Get, get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, I think we should wrap this call yeah. up. I heard that there is a new uh, Amazon Prime show with a woman who competes in the Olympics with men. Yeah, what? What? <laughs> I gotta go. All right, great. <laughs> it's it's literally it's like, is that like even a real like, show? You know, no, I just wanted to get that off the phone. I was watching uh, the, um, the the latest uh, Super Friends uh, movie, and the idea that uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, can swing a lasso like that. Like just the idea like a woman could do could do a lasso, you know, cause she was, uh, cause Superman picked her up, flew in and uh, then she had this lasso. And I was like, I just don't buy the lasso part. You know, <laughs> it keeps these kinds of people off the streets. If nothing else. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, Apropos of nothing, Ben Shapiro should take a little break, take a little sabbatical and write, another pilot yeah let's see that now. um oh here Go is uh it. donald Follow trump we should tune into this we we, we we missed this the other day uh donald trump was at a um uh, a rally in miami florida and had a uh, full uh the full monty of evangelical pastors out there and i don't know if this happened before or after he gave the uh speech uh before of course because you want to get blessed before um if you thought the orb freaked you out folks um God, here we go. And a champion for freedom. And Lord, that's exactly what we have. I thank you, Lord, that he doesn't claim to be perfect, but he is passionate. He's passionate for the, to look at the, stop look on the his merciless face. killing of the unborn. He's passionate to raise people from poverty, and six million have been moved from food stamps to the dignity of work. He is passionate, oh God, to see our Supreme Court filled with men and women who will stand for justice for all. And Lord, we thank you for all that you have begun. And now that you have begun it in our nation, in the middle, we pray that you would bless. There you go. I, it's all just sort of feels like it's all they, they, they think the money is literally going to flow out of his pockets into theirs. Season two of Righteous Gemstones looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, is that David Lynch standing next to him? Because this is quite the Lynchian scene. Here he goes on to uh, here's the, um, uh, the, the part of the speech that he gives. And um, it's I, I, I don't know if he has much more to say to them uh, other than this. Charlie. Charlie Kirk. Hi, Charlie. 
He could be a pastor. He'd be a very good pastor, I'll tell you. <laughs> Every day since I've been fighting for you, and we really have, we've achieved results that nobody thought was possible because things were looking very bleak. Pause it for one second. Of- Look, things were looking bleak for a long period of time, but let's hear. Let's hear what his big achievement is. Time, things were looking very bleak. Even a thing like Merry Christmas. Remember, it used to go around in the summer. I'd say, we're going to say Christmas again. We're going to say Christmas again. And now they're all saying Merry Christmas again, right? They're all saying it. You'd go to these big department stores three years ago, four years ago, and they'd have the snow, and they'd have the red and the white, and they'd have everything. But they wouldn't say Christmas. I said, where's Merry Christmas? And they said, we can't say it. They're all saying it again. They're saying it proudly. I, I, you know, um, guess what's not, guess, guess what you're not going to do. Convince them of anything else. If that's like, if that's their thing and that's what they believe, that's it. I think it's the ship has sailed. As a scholar of the, this war, this war on Christmas, do you feel like now that he's talking about it in January and in the summer that it qualifies as another one of America's endless wars? It is. It is become an endless war on some respects. I mean, he was saying the key is to say, like, you know, I've gone around I mean, the last June. I was walking around. Nobody was saying uh, Merry Christmas. Nobody. 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 Then I focused on it for about six months or so. Boom. Everybody's saying Merry Christmas. In the uh, classic Trump Vader video, when uh, they they dubbed all of these amazing Trump moments over uh, Darth Vader scenes, the part I don't remember which Star Wars movie it is where where uh, I think where he tells Luke that he's his dad and Luke decides to like drop himself down some kind of shaft. The lines that they chose to use were Trump just being like, "You ever go into Macy's?" And you know I got these new cufflinks from Macy's. Not big thing just nice little cufflinks and but they don't say merry christmas anymore <laughs> that's that's the scene where, where the luke just drops himself down the unbelievable wouldn't you here is uh bernie on uh do we want to play this one first or the view first um, it depends what's right in that order, but you want to the Bernie's answer is right. stronger. Well, let's one. let's go with the View first. Um, here is uh, Elizabeth Warren is on the View, um, and uh, apparently they still let Meghan McCain on set. She has to. She's a political analyst for ABC News. Um, here is uh, here is this is from today, right? Today's View. You um, first of all, I we have had conversations. I believe you respect the American military and respect our troops. You traveled overseas many times, so I just want to say that first and foremost. Sure. Um, you issued a statement calling. You know, you know why this like a political analyst is like. I want to just say that you are okay. I I have decided because my dad uh, was in the military <laughs> that you have passed my test of showing enough respect. For the military. So I just want to preface that up front. That you get the blessing, the Meghan McCain blessing of enough respect for the military. Soleimani, a murderer. Later, wait, wait, no, go back, go back a little bit so, so we can see what she was saying. You just said that first and foremost. Sure. Um, you issued a statement calling, calling Soleimani a murderer. Later, you issued a second statement saying that he was, quote, an assassination of a senior foreign military official. Now, this is a man who obviously is responsible for hundreds of American troops, deaths, carnage that we can't even imagine. The Treasury Department and the State Department have both ne- designated the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization. Mm-hmm. I don't understand the flip-flop. I, I don't understand... Flip-flop. Why it was so hard to call him a terrorist, and I would just like you to explain. So, uh, I, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate your kind comments. You know, all three of my brothers yes, served in the yes. military. We've talked and about I believe this you, before. No, yes, no, I believe you respect and, the military. And, and I know you do, too. Mm-hmm. Um, this isn't a change. They're true. The question is, what is the response that the President of the United States should make and what advances the interests of the United States of America. Think about Saddam Hussein. Mm. You want to talk about a a bad guy, right? (laughs) However, going to war in Iraq 
was not in the interest of the United States. Yeah. We lost thousands of American lives. It cost us here at home. It has cost us around the world. It has been a part of this cost in the Middle East that has ended up with millions of people who've lost their lives, who've been injured, uh, who've been displaced. The question for the President of the United States is to understand what's going on, have an overall strategy, and pick an appropriate response. And going back to Kobe's question, at an he's a terrorist? appropriate time. Right. He's part of a group that has but been is he designated. A terrorist? He is part of a group that's been designated. So he's not a terrorist. Just, of course he is. He's okay. part of a group that our federal government has designated as a terrorist. The question, though, is what's the right response? And the response that Donald Trump has picked is the most incendiary and has moved us right to the edge of war. It I mean, you know, the uh, I, I appreciate the fact that she basically uh, made Meghan McCain sit there and accept the critique of the Iraq war, which her father was a great champion of. Um, and the idea uh, that he is a terrorist is completely irrelevant to this question. Um, it depends on how you want to define terrorists. But the thing that is indisputable is that he was a government official. He was part of the military. He was a general. It was an assassination. You can say he's a murderer in the same way that you could say, like, uh, Donald Rumsfeld's a torturer or that uh, Dick murderer. Cheney a, and a mur yeah, murderer. And right. that I would just, be true of all of those people. Indeed. Indeed. And um, the, the idea is that, you know, if you want to say that we are at war with Iran, go and get a declaration of war and say that we are actually active in military battles against Iran. But this is like... But this is not so what it was. It was an assassination. It was absolutely an assassination. And I just want to say, though, like two... I mean, one, we basically, like Trita Parsi said, we are at war with Iran. We have been trading back and forth with them and, and certainly we're in economic war with them since Trump came into office. And I... I don't want to I want to be really careful here. I'm not going into like some contrarian like he was a great guy or whatever, but just this whole discourse of talking about people like that in these cartoonish silly way like killed Americans. I don't know. We're fighting proxy wars. Like he didn't no, to be very clear, no. He when we use terminology like terrorism he was not a guy who planned operations where you go to a bakery and blow it up to kill people or you go and shoot people at a synagogue. He was in a proxy war with the United States where we attacked soldiers and agents from each other's sides. And he organized militias in a number of different effort, efforts, including most recently, by the way, a main reason in the Middle East and essentially in Iraq why ISIS was defeated. Right. The Iraqi army completely dissolved. So I'm not absolving him. I'm just saying like we need to, but I'm not absolving anybody. Like we need to talk about these things in an adult way. There's people from the United States who do exactly well, what right. he but did I'm talking in the United about, States. She's on the view. And so there's not going to be an adult conversation well, no, and nuance. The, the bottom line is, well, is that it's irrelevant. Like, well, right. And that's why the, the first idea. statement has to be like, you know, Bernie just came out and said, this is reckless and dangerous. Here's exactly. why. Boom, 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 boom. Exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. and if anyone could take McMegan to school on that, you would think Warren's demeanor might help her to do so. And she almost did, but she still both sides did a little too much for me. Uh, here just is, like Americans aren't going over there giving them super soakers and wedgies. Like we're playing, we're fighting each other. You know, this is what happens. You know? uh, here is Bernie on uh, Anderson Cooper talking about the same uh, topic. Entire world, but uh, Anderson, what frightens me most is what we are seeing now sounds very much like what I observed uh, in, and the American people observed in terms of the war in Iraq, something that I vigorously opposed. Uh, what we heard was an administration lying about intelligence. We got involved in a war we never should have got involved in. We lost 4,500 brave soldiers. Thousands more were wounded. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis were displaced and died. We spent trillions of dollars on that war that should have been spent at home providing health care or rebuilding our infrastructure. And now at the end of all of that, the government, the country that we were trying to save, to liberate, says, get out. We don't want you anymore. So 
That lesson must be learned. And I think, if anything, we get involved in a war in Iran, in all likelihood, it will be even worse. And I will do everything I can as a United States senator in terms of the War Powers Act, in terms of defunding any effort of the Trump administration to go to war, do anything I can to stop what I think will be another disaster. As you just referenced, the Iraqi uh, parliament voted yesterday in favor of expelling U.S. troops fr from the country. I mean, if American forces are actually expelled, and it's not clear that it would actually come to that, would that be a good thing in your opinion? Because you've called for an end to endless wars in the Middle East. The United States should have gotten our troops out of Iraq long time ago. But it has to be done in an orderly manner in conjunction with the Iraqi government so that the anti-terrorist activity can continue. It is not a good thing when after spending trillions of dollars and losing 4,500 soldiers that you are booted out of the country, you went to liberate. That I mean, that's not, uh, you know, that is, he's, he's basically saying we need to maintain a presence there. Um, yeah, great on Iran. I don't like the word liberate with regards to right. what we did in Iraq I think at he's all. being a little bit facetious yeah. with that, uh, yeah. ostensibly. Yeah, um, all right, let's play this uh, one more uh, clip of uh, uh, on the five, and then we, uh, we got to take one call, and then we'll get out of here. Um, Pete Hegseth on uh, Fox 5. Now, he was almost going to be the uh, head of the VA because at one point he had uh, been part of a lobbying group um, and that, uh, you know, some type of PAC, uh, not much executive uh, experience, this guy. Um, at one point, he also, um, I think he, he refused to wash his hands. Isn't that the big Pete Hegseth story? He refused to wash his hands because he didn't believe in germs. Something to that effect. Oh, that's where you got that from? Yeah. <laughs> that's why you want to, you want to, you want to uh, run the uh, nation's largest health uh, system. But but the one thing he has done is come out strongly in favor of uh, war criminals uh, walking uh, free. And uh, here he is um, defending even more war crimes. That is the targeting, despite the fact the Pentagon has now said we won't do that, the targeting of cultural centers. One of the reasons why we did not bomb Kyoto in World War II was because of the cultural relevance to both Japan and the world of, uh, of that city. Um, we have the Geneva Conventions and uh, we have um, the Hague Conventions that have... Um, explicitly made the targeting of culturally relevant sites a war crime. But not when you're on the five on Fox. Pete, when you hear the Democrats saying, wait, why, why did he do this now? Is this related to impeachment? What do you think? I think with friends like these Democrats, who needs the Iranians? Mm. I mean, ultimately, this is the resistance what? continuing across overseas as adamantly as we've seen it here at home. Listen, you may not like President Trump. You may have voted for the impeachment in the House. But if you're, if you're someone like Comrade Cortez of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeting, saying that a tweet from the president threatening the Iranians is in, a, in and of itself a war crime, you've lost your mind. Wait a second, you, wait a second. That was related to no, that was related to, to destroy the cultural 52 sites one of which yes. might be cultural actually by the way I don't care about Iranian cultural sites and I'll tell you why if they could if Iran could if you understand the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, of Islamists if they could if they had the power they would, they would destroy every single one of our cultural sites and build a mosque on top of it. If you don't understand the nature of our enemy, you're foolish about who you're pointing out and, and whether or not you're happy that Soleimani is dead. This guy has exported terrorism for that regime for 40 years. And the fact that Democrats in this country can't take a pause to say, this is a good thing, now let's figure out how to prevent an Iranian bomb, they just go straight to politics. And it's, it's shameful. So, so Yeah. Well... It was kind of hard to concentrate on the racism just then, though, just like thinking about all the germs on his hands. Yeah. Um, first of all, Iran certainly has the capacity to knock out some of our cultural 
centers. Um, and uh, the idea that they want to is just, I mean, we put up a, we heard the, the, the Supreme Leader of Iran yesterday say this is not about the American people. Um, and uh, the fact remains that it is a war crime to target uh, cultural centers, whether Pete Hegseth cares about that or not. Oh, they fetishize war crimes on this channel. It's and unbelievable. I mean, and, and I mean, I uh, it just even if you care just on a nation branding level, um, it, you used to have, okay, you had Iran's foreign minister who speaks English very well. He's very good on television. He makes these very sensible points about international law and so on. Now you have the head of Hezbollah and the supreme leader looking like responsible humanitarians relative to Trump, yep. which they are relative to Trump. And that's not a compliment of them. All right. That's just the truth. One final call of the day. Call from an 847 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Sorry, folks. We don't have time for any other calls. Tomorrow we, uh, we, we're we wide open, right? We'll take calls from the beginning tomorrow. Call them from, uh, well, I always say that, but we never <clears throat> 847. Who's this? <laughs> I'm so honored. It's Josh from Chicago. Josh from Chicago. I would give you the fanfare, but uh, the uh, soundboard is broken. What's on your mind? I have fanfare? No. Don't blow oh. it. Don't blow I, it. I, okay. Okay. Play cool. Um, oh, I just wanted to um, talk about something actually really quickly. Um, I went to the um, a march against anti-Semitism on Sunday. Actually, I didn't go to the march part. I went to the rally part. Um because uh, I wasn't feeling great, but um, you know, I think I guess there were multiple marches um, in every city. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this. It was actually on Sunday. Um, um, Josh, ADL, apparently you're not following my uh, Twitter feed because I was walking across the bridge. Oh, you were okay. Yeah. Um, I just I want to talk about the rally for a second. Um, I was incredibly disappointed. Um, they spent more time at the rally talking about Rashida Tlaib's Twitter feed and uh, the Labor Party than actual anti-Semitism, and I guess I should expect this from the ADL. Um, and it was also disappointing because I think Bernie Sanders, uh, someone Bernie Sanders hired recently was supposed to speak. I didn't see him speak. He might have spoke after I left. I think I left a little bit early. But um, I just wanted to, um, and I don't know um, how you felt about this and if you felt the same way. Um, it was... Um, especially disappointing with the Rashida Tlaib thing because she is supporting the only Jewish candidate in the race for president. And um, I, I personally found the image of Bernie, I think it was New Year's Eve, of him with the uh, yarmulke uh, to be very powerful, and uh, very, especially in a time of anti-Semitism, a very powerful image of representation. And I just, do you think we're going to still have to put up with this uh, shit, especially if Bernie keeps, um, gaining momentum in the race, um, they're sort of trying to tie anti-Semitism to him. Because to me, it, I, it kind of felt like they were really trying to put an effort of trying to tie anti-Semitism to the left. And um, it didn't make me feel safe as a Jewish person. All right. Well, I appreciate the call, Josh. Let me let you go and answer. I did not make it down to Cadman Plaza uh, for the speeches because uh, it took us about three, three and a half hours to get across the bridge. Um uh, and my daughter was was had 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 enough at that point. Um, but yes, I mean, I think, you know, part of the reason why I, I felt it was important to to go. I mean, obviously, we've had problems in New York City in particular, but uh, around the country. Um, but part of my reason of going to was to make it clear that, uh, you know, the left uh, is as invested in this as not. And. You know, uh, as I was coming off the bridge, I tweeted about this and spoke about it yesterday. Uh, what's her face? Barry Weiss is trying to do that very that same thing. Leverage this speech. I mean, the uh, the the um, protest, the march to attack the left, to attack Bernie Sanders. We saw this from the ambassador from Israel. Was they, uh, you know, retweeting and nominating Ilhan Omar as the 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 greatest anti-Semite in 2019. This is a year where 11 Jews were shot in the synagogue in Pittsburgh. It is um, what they are willing to do. To uh, to taint Bernie Sanders in particular. 
It's psychotic. It's psychotic. It's psychotic. It's extremely dangerous. And um, it, we're, uh, it's going to beget more anti-Semitism, without a doubt, because it is um, to weaponize the pushback against anti-Semitism makes it that much harder to push back against anti-Semitism. Because the, the last thing you want is people not to show up at that march because they think it's going to end up being what, in some respects, it was. It's a problem. It's a big problem. Appreciate the call, Josh. All right, folks, that is it for our time today. I didn't have uh, an IM and I don't have uh, my soundboard. So uh, I'm just going to have to say we will see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. Truth and life bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid I guess I lost my